So we'll get right into uh, the items. I believe, okay, item number one is the update. We'll hold that. Item two is the uh, performance reports. And there's a presentation with that. So we'll hold on to that as well. And item number three is the transit service evaluation criteria. And again, we have a presentation on that so, and a speaker. So we're going to hold that item. And finally, four is the status update of transit commission inquiries and motions. Uh, can we accept that? Yes. Received? Received. 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 Okay, thank you. So let's go back to item number one. And uh, Mr. Manconi, I believe you've got your presentation ready to go. So whenever you're ready to start. Chair, Chair, can I just ask a question? That's Councillor Brockington. Sure. Uh, where would we entertain my motion for today? Uh, after the update. Thank you. Okay. I'll call on you when, when we're through here. Go thank ahead, you, Mr. Chair. Manconi. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Charter for the presentation. All right, perfect. So if you go to the, the overview next slide, that'd be great. So like, uh, like previous presentations, um, we'll start with the performance of line one, an update on the rectification plan and train wheels. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Pat, who will provide some information on the transit recovery update and uh, COVID-19. So as you can see, uh, you know, the, the next couple graphs, the ones that we've been presenting in the last few transit commission meetings, uh, this graph here shows again that, uh, you know, well, for the, the past eight months, we've, uh, we've achieved over 97% uh, for eight consecutive months, of which six of those months have been over 98%. And so far for the month of April, uh, for the first half of April, we're right now we're at 99% of service, uh, plan service. Next slide, please. Uh, so once again, this train, this, this graph is showing the, um, the, the performance on a, both a monthly and a daily basis. We continue to see um, high degree of reliability, uh, both daily and monthly, less and less variability. That's why that line is staying above that, the, the dotted line, which represents the 97%. And you're not seeing those uh, those dips in performance that we saw. You know, now it was two winters ago, and and then the summer of last year. So we're seeing um, much more stable service on a daily basis, and that then translates into uh, the monthly service performance. Next slide, please. And then the last slide is, as I said, as I've said many times, it's the graphical representation of the previous two. Um, you know, the the interesting piece here is is again you're seeing less and less outliers. So less and less days where service is falling below 97% or even below that. Um, so that's why you're seeing that um, that green bar um, to the well to the to the top right of the of the screen here. It's um, you know it's above 97% and it's a fairly fairly small bar, which is representing the fact that you know most of the, most service days where we are achieving right around that 97, 98, 99%. So good reliability, good consistency on a day to day basis. Next slide, please. With respect to the rectification plan, you know we've, we've communicated uh, previously that uh, you know a lot of the work is effectively complete. So you know the first five items: switch heaters, the the cat overhead catenary system, traction power, passenger doors, and the vehicle at HVAC is considered complete. Work does continue um, on the vehicle auxiliary power or CBS units and the, and the other functioning the braking systems, largely software related, where it's a series of uh, of adjustments and you, you need to you know, take, take your time and make sure that everything's validated in between those steps. Um, and then, you know, you know, again, it, it's, it's worth noting, but all the completed works and, and the work that's ongoing is subject to the validation of the independent assessment, which is currently ongoing and, and wrapping up shortly. Uh, next slide, please. I did, uh, we did talk about two other additional pieces of work, um, one being track. So with regards to the track work, where we are in the final preparations with, with RT, RTM to, to conduct the signal track work um, late uh, late spring, early summer. Um, you know, we, um, we anticipate that there will be temporary service adjustments to allow for that work to happen. So we are currently uh, finalizing those details, making sure that uh, well, RTG is securing the equipment, the resources, as well as the plan that it will, uh, you know, we'll talk about what we need to do at certain portions, uh, certain section of the track, you know, the, the curves as opposed to the straight track, those types of things. That work is ongoing and, and we do anticipate some temporary service adjustments uh, that would be, we'll be communicating in advance. Um, 
talked about coupler inspections and so it, it was attributed to potentially attributed to some uh, service disruptions earlier in the year. Um, all the inspections and the associated work is complete on 20 of those vehicles and uh, the remaining vehicles are planned to be completed within the next month. It's also important to note here that we've had no recent occurrences of any uh, service disruptions associated with couplers, so positive, uh, positive work there. And uh, additionally, I'd like to notify you that uh, the 11 train schedule that we implemented for March and April, uh, we will be extending that for an additional three months, so May, June, and July. Um, and then we'll be using the, the August month uh, to ramp up to the, the normal 15 trains in the AM and the 13 trains in the PM. Next slide, please. And then lastly, with regards to the, the train wheels, uh, the wheel replacements are ongoing and we continue to use the, um, the, this period of low ridership to, to get that work complete. Um, you know, I, I do need, need to state this every single time because I, I want it to be clear that the daily inspections of the fleet is continuing and it will continue until, you know, the wheels are replaced or those set screws are adjusted. Um, inspection replacement work is complete, is, is proceeding at both sites. We talked about that previously. And um, we, we continue to participate in, in um, with the, the TSB's independent investigation and whatever parties that are needed, whether it be the chief safety officer, the RMCO, or other experts, um, we involve them and we make sure we keep Transport Canada involved as well. And uh, that's it for my update. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Pat Scrimger, who will provide the transit recovery update. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Go to the next slide, please, Eric. So in March, uh, we were at 26% of our usual levels of transit ridership. Um, certainly we expect April to be a lower number and uh, May perhaps as well, as the current uh, public health restrictions uh, have just come into effect. So we'll be watching those numbers and we'll report to you next time. Um, we continue to monitor ridership and continue to make changes to transit service where necessary. The next slide, please. Uh, so as of the uh, date we prepared this presentation, since the beginning of the pandemic, 106 of uh, our co-workers at OC Transpo have tested positive for COVID-19. 80 of those have recovered and are back to work. 26 uh, are continuing to self-isolate and recover. And um, the next slide, please. And I think that's the end of our presentation. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Charter and Mr. Scringer. So uh, there's no delegations for the update this time. Uh, we did receive a written submission uh, from Mr. Jan Lamb. I uh, believe everybody's got a copy of that. Uh, so now, uh, we, before we go into questions of staff, we have um, to, uh, a couple of motions to introduce first related to the update. Uh, Councillor Brockington, would you like to introduce your motion first, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, and good morning. Uh, members of the commission uh, received this yesterday, and, and thank you to the committee coordinator as well. Um, so, Chair, I'm moving a motion today that would ask um, the mayor through city council to write to the province and Dr. Etches of Ottawa Public Health to pr put a greater uh, priority on vaccinations for essential workers, including transit employees. If you look at the data in particular um, that has been provided to me, that's included in my motion from OC Transpo, certainly the more aggressive uh, variants of this virus have um, impacted our transit staff at a much greater rate in the first few months of 2021 than all of 2020, 55 employees in 2021 versus all of uh, 51 and all of 2020. So um, this really isn't a debate about which essential workers are more important than others. Um, this is a discussion that needs to be had that there needs to be greater emphasis and priority on essential workers. We've been calling them heroes since the first day and yet there are so many essential workers who today have still not been vaccinated, including uh, public facing transit employees. So chair, I, I want to put that on the floor. I'm happy to entertain questions and, and listen to the debate, but, and I've spoken to a number of colleagues as well. There may be some, some modified language or wording to make this more palatable to folks, but really my, my intent here is to acknowledge that we have had staff show up every single day 
since the pandemic started, we have never stopped uh, providing service to the people of Ottawa who rely on public transit. And there needs to be a greater push and priority on essential workers and transit workers are absolutely in that category. So Chair, I'll leave it there and happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, uh, before we go on to questions on your motion, we're also going to introduce the other motion uh, related to the update, if you don't mind. Uh, Councillor Gower, uh, could you introduce your motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was um, considering this as a friendly, um, but it's, as I was writing it, substantially different, I think, than, um, than what Councillor Brockington has introduced. Um, does the committee coordinator, Eric, do you have that, that you could put it on screen? Do you want me to read this out, Chair? Uh, please, if you don't mind, Councillor Gower. Okay. Uh, whereas the City of Ottawa declared a state of emergency as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic on March 17, 2020, and whereas during the pandemic, OC Trans will continue to operate continuously without one day of cancelled service, and whereas OC Transville personnel who work as bus, train, and para operators, transit supervisors, O-Train ambassadors, and transit supervisors come into direct contact with the people, with the public, and are essential to its success, and whereas many OC Transville personnel who provide critical service to the entire system may not be in direct contact with the public, but also provide essential service, and whereas the service provided by OC Transville and its staff supports our city's frontline essential workers and their transportation needs, and Whereas public transit workers are included in phase two of the technical framework for COVID-19 vaccine distribution developed by the province of Ontario. Therefore, be it resolved that the Transit Commission direct the chair to write to Ottawa's Medical Officer of Health to emphasize the role of public transit workers in enabling essential work to continue in the city of Ottawa and ask that this be shared with the Ottawa Vaccine Sequencing Task Force for their consideration as they undertake the work of sequencing essential workers who cannot work from home, including transit workers. And I bring this to the commission as an alternative motion. Uh, on Monday evening, um, the Board of Health sat for five hours and heard from a number of essential workers, including um, early childhood educators and child care providers. And we heard extensively from Dr. Etches and her team and also Tony DeMonte about some of the difficult decisions being made around vaccine prioritization and vaccine rollout. Um, I do think it's important to recognize the essential work that our transit employees are doing right now. In particular, the backbone work that they do, they provide the transportation and mobility for other essential workers to actually get to their job. So I, I think we really need to emphasize and recognize the work that they're doing and the role that it plays in our city's ability to function and, and to get essential workers to where they need to go. Um, I guess uh, as a transit commissioner, I'm also wearing the hat of a board of health member. And I wanna be really cautious about um, how we decide to sequence one group of essential workers and uh, over another. And I wanna be really cautious about the language and the wording that we're using in any motion. Um, so I, I think uh, what I've put in front of the commission tries to capture that. Uh, it's a very difficult balance that we have here. And so I hope that the committee will uh, will consider this motion and and support what I'm uh, what I'm putting forward this morning. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gower. Um, uh, Mr. Manconi, uh, would you like to uh, speak to these motions before we go into debate? Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, first, I want to thank members of the committee uh, that uh, are. Um, very passionate about uh, you know giving the credit to our staff that is uh, that is due and that is earned by them. You know we're calling them heroes and that's that's what they are. Uh, they have been here every single day of this pandemic, and um, they've been there not just moving essential workers around, but also they've been part of the vaccine rollout. You've seen the buses at all the uh, locations. Uh, we've been shuttling people around when there's been cancellations, and and there will be more of that. Um, and so they are heroes and uh, they've always been heroes in my mind. And uh, this, this pandemic has demonstrated how critical they are to, to our city and our livability of our city. Um, I wanna share with members of the committee a couple of things. First off, I've had multiple discussions with Dr. Etches, including last night on this very complicated subject. 
and I've shared with her the discussions I've had with Clint Crabtree, the union leader who is very passionate about protecting his members as you are. And what's troubling members is the uncertainty. It's, it's the when. And, and um, uh, you know, the motions are, are important. Um, um, I, I don't want to pick one over the other, but I, I can say that where there, there is congruency. And so if the friendly amendments work out, Councillor uh, Commissioner Gowers points it in the right direction as it directs it to the experts, because I'm not an expert in this field. And whatever Dr. Etches can do with science and with, with influence at the provincial table, staff are looking for certainty. Um, and I know some people will say, well, now if you're 40 and, and you can go get vaccinated, we have lots of staff that are, are, are much younger than that. And they're looking for certainty also. And, and so I wanna thank uh, both commissioners for, for uh, the care. And, and I know many of you do, because I've seen the discussions. Um, the uh, directing this to public health uh, and asking Dr. Etches to put as much influence and try to create the certainty um, will help us all because then at least Clint and myself can answer, here's, here's when, uh, or at least narrow that uncertainty down. That's the anxiety. Uh, yes, the new variant is, uh, has caused some spikes. I can tell you that our COVID task force that was in place from day one um, has implemented every single measure that staff have brought forward. We're just moving to exterior tent rentals for eating areas and so forth uh, for staff. And, uh, um, you know, we, we have all the data from public health that helps us respond to every single one of this uh, situation, including contact tracing and so forth. So I want to thank members of, of commission for this. And um, my advice to you is, is directed to public health to get as much certainty as we can for our, for our heroes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mangoni. And um, whereas both these motions have to, to do with uh, prioritizing uh, transit riders as essential service, I wonder if uh, I can call on the Chair of the Board of Health to uh, provide some guidance on uh, his thoughts on the two motions as well, which would best uh, accomplish what we wanna do here. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Hubley. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and uh, first of all, let me echo the sentiment that we've heard around the table so far uh, about the great work that that all OC Transpo employees are doing during this, the, these very difficult times. Um, I, I can say, uh, Chair Hubley, that um, we had our, I'm told, our second longest uh, public health meeting ever on uh, Monday night. And the vast majority of that time was spent talking about the vaccine rollout. And, uh, and a lot of that was about, about priority and sequencing. And uh, quite a number of, of members of the board also do double duty and sit on, your, sit on this co uh, commission as well. Um, so they're well aware of those, those discussions. And after much discussion and hearing from 25 uh, delegates on this, on this particular question, um, the, the approach that's set out in, in uh, Commissioner Gower's uh, motion is, is what the board uh, landed on as the most appropriate way to deal with it. Um, vaccine sequencing is obviously a very difficult uh, maze to get through, especially in light of the vaccine uh, supply that we have now. Um, Mr. Mancone speaks to certainty, and I think we would all like that. And, and of course, most, most of that comes down to when the vaccines are going to be available and in what quantity. And, and I know Mr. DeMonte, who's not on the line this morning, but Mr. DeMonte is in constant discussion with the province around this um, and, uh, and with, with public health in that regard as well. So I would urge the commissioners, um, we, we, we had to be the, the other part of the, the difficult discussion on, on Monday night is, of course, the board um, can uh, suggest or ask Dr. Etches in her role as MOH to do things, but the board doesn't have the authority to tell Dr. Etches to do things. It's, it's similar to the relationship that Councillor Deans or Commissioner Deans would be familiar with with the Police Services Board and the, and the Chief of Police. It's, it's, a, it's a working collaborative uh, relationship. 
And, and so I say, after five hours of back and forth and discussions and, and, and what have you, uh, the, uh, the approach that Councillor Gower is espousing is the approach that was acceptable uh, to Dr. Etch, is the one that she thought made the most sense from, uh, from a fairness and a science perspective to put it in the hands of the vaccine uh, sequencing, ta sequencing tax force, which is made up of a variety of members of the, of the scientific uh, community uh, and, and other community members to, to arrive at, to take into account what's being said, take into account what's being uh, discussed around various essential workers and, and to balance that off against risk levels, um, vaccine supply and all those other factors. That, that they're uniquely qualified to look at and to discuss. So, um, uh, so again, um, Chair Hubley, I, I would recommend, I, I can't vote today, but, but I would recommend uh, that those who can support uh, Councillor Gower's motion, that's the one that's most in sync with, with what public health thinks is the way forward on this and the one that they will be able to work with most effectively. So thank you for the time to, uh, to speak to that. Okay, thank you uh, very much, um, uh, Councillor Aguilar. Uh, uh, your input's greatly appreciated on this. I think the other point we've got to um, keep in mind, Commission, is that uh, on April 9th, the mayor already requested that uh, to the province that transit workers be considered essential service and be queued uh, for the vaccines. So uh, before before we go to uh, staff questions and debate on the motions, one last person wants to get ahead of the queue here, and that's Councillor Brockington has asked to just quickly give a clarification of what his intent is. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I really appreciate the um, the words from both Mr. Manconi and, and Chair Eglai. <clears throat> I have no issue with us um, uh, solely contemplating Councillor Gower's motion. The one addition I would like us to consider is in addition to our um, guidance to Dr. Etches, consider an additional ask to the province. They continue to make decisions and prioritize cohorts that impact Ottawa. And in addition to us making a statement to Dr. Etches, I would really like us to see as well providing that statement to the province. So I'm willing to withdraw my motion to make this quicker, focus on Councillor Gower's motion. But for me, in addition to anything that we say to Dr. Etches, we should be making a statement to the province. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. So it, this is, uh, you're basically asking the mayor to repeat what he said on April 9th? Well, let's do the, first of all, I'm willing to withdraw my motion. Let's just make right. this, okay? And I will reserve some time to speak. So let's just deal with Councillor Gower's motion and I'll okay. articulate it better. Okay, thank you. So now we'll go into, if you, if commission members have any questions to staff to do with the uh, update from um, Mr. Charter and Mr. Scrimger, or if you uh, wish to speak to Councillor Gower's motion, then uh, please do so. So first up on my screen is uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you. Actually, I thought uh, Councillor uh, Wright Gilbert was ahead of me, so, but that's... Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I sit on the Board of Health as well. Um, so um, I was there and um, it, this is a tough call to say who's the most important essential worker. Um, we heard very, very passionate debate about childcare workers. That was the whole gist of, of most of the witnesses we heard on Monday night. And frankly, as the, the liaison on women and gender equity, it, it's, a, it's a profession that is dominated by women. And um, so it's, it's heartbreaking to uh, say one group over another. Um, I, I totally get the argument for transit workers. They're very important to us, uh, obviously. And um, I would have, uh, you know, I, I would have supported that, but I, I don't feel comfortable putting them over and above when um, we have a, a group that came to us very, very passionately at the board meeting. I'm wondering if we can put um, a small amendment of when you say including transit workers and childcare workers. I know this is the transit commission, but yeah. um, 
I feel that that, it, it, that we have to recognize what, what we've heard. And, um, and I, I think that's important. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, but I don't believe that would be in order because, you know, the, the work of the Transit Commission does not involve the child care workers. And I, the whole gist of what Councillor Gower is saying is that public health is the one that should be making these decisions and making the recommendations to the province, not the Transit Commission on uh, the vaccinations. So, um, I, I'm going to say that that would not be a, a proper amendment. If, if you want to challenge the chair, we can go to the clerk on it. Well, um, you said including transit workers. So you've already said uh, uh, that. Um, so I, I don't see why including another group um, when you're talking about essential workers would be, uh, would be out of order. It's not the Transit Commission that identifies who all are uh, um, essential workers. If, if we uh, accept your amendment to include child care workers, then any other commissioner can also add to that list. The next thing you know, we're sending the list of what we think are essential workers over to a public health to deal with. And, and my understanding from the members that were there on Monday night, they've already dealt with that. And as the chair, uh, Egli pointed out, there is a task force that does the, the queuing of the essential workers, identifying who they are and where in the lineup they should be. It is not the work of the commission to do that. Okay, well, I, I, I think it's a missed opportunity because um, this is a group that we, we heard from very strongly and um, also at risk. And I'm not trying to take away from transit workers because I, I, I feel strongly that they're on the front lines and um, doing very, very important work for us. I would agree with you, and uh, I just think that uh, a motion to do with child care workers would be better placed at public health, or if you want to take it to community and protective services that has oversight over that uh, uh, area, it would be a better fit there. But I don't want us at the Transit Commission to start uh, making a list of who's essential and where in the queue they should go. Okay, I'll take, I'll take that away. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, can okay. I ask other questions or? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I wanted, uh, originally I put my hand up for the report. <laughs> so, um, and uh, on on um, on what's happening with our, our bus service. And uh, this is a question um, for Mr. Scrimger. And it was um, in relation to um, what we're planning um, in terms of uh, Carling Avenue, because um, we're, we're redoing um, the road and we're going to have uh, bus lanes coming in, um, the third lanes on each side um, from uh, Bayswater right up to Lincoln Field Station. And I wanna know um, if we're gonna have any immediate changes since this is coming in in uh, late summer, fall, um, if we're looking at uh, changes to the service to, to go with that. Oh, well. Carling Avenue is a, a busy street for transit service. It's got a number of important routes um, operating along it, Route 85, 55, um, 56, and others that feed into uh, Lincoln Field Station. Um, we have, uh, you know, so, the, so the, the new bus lanes will certainly um, uh, set us up for improved reliability, perhaps reduce travel time. Um, that we'll have to see with experience. And that may draw more, more customers to that uh, corridor than have been using it in the past as ridership returns. We'll have to watch as ridership returns, but I think it'll be uh, quite possible that, um, you know, as ridership comes back with these bus lanes in place, it may be that more of that ridership is on car length than it has been in the past. People, some people have been avoiding that route when it uh, was suffering from unreliability because of a conflict with auto traffic. Um, We'll have to uh, watch how that goes, watch what, what the uh, patterns are of travel as people return. There are some opportunities, uh, especially uh, you know, with the bus lane, but also as the stage two work continues, there are definitely opportunities to um, uh, bring more routes in and use Lincoln Fields as more of a focal point. Uh, it's been a, a, an important focal point in the past, but to make it even more of a focal point for some of the um, the services in that area that have been connecting at other locations in the past. Thank you, because uh, as you probably know, um, it's going to—it's an arterial main street. More development is going to take place. So, 
Um, I think people will be looking forward to uh, finding out what the, what the focus is on, on the transit service if we're having these lanes put in and um, what updates are gonna be made. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kavanaugh. Uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert, please. Good morning. Um, I don't have any questions on the presentation itself. Uh, just a couple things about the, the various motions and the discussion that we've been having with respect to essential workers and vaccinations. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, essential workers should be vaccinated as soon as possible. They are, as the title says, providing essential services to our community. Um, they cannot work from home like I am right now and like many, all of us are essentially. Um, so I think that that's something we can all agree on. Um, what I would hope is that we can all also agree, much like um, <clears throat> Councillor Aguilar said and, and Mr. Mancone, I agree with Mr. Mancone, um, we're not public health experts. As far as I know, none of us are public health experts. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not one, I can tell you that, even though I work, in, uh, I work for Health Canada. What I will say is this, Dr. Etches and our various advisory, medical advisory committees are the public health experts and should be the ones that are making decisions with respect to prioritization for vaccines. Um, Mr. Mancone made, raised an interesting point where he said that the, the main concern for our transit workers and, and essential workers is when will they get the vaccine? I'll expand that to, that's the main concern for all of us who haven't received it already. I turned 40 in two weeks and I'm registered with, I think every pharmacy in the city to try to get a vaccine. Um, but I, you know, I'm waiting my turn. Um, I've never been so excited to turn 40 and get a needle. Um, but I, I think that, and I agree with the chair, uh, that we, we are not in a position in transit commission to be decreeing or, or making an edict about who is, what group of essential workers is more at risk than others and should be prioritized. That needs to be left up to public, public health experts. And that is key in this entire discussion about COVID that decisions be, should be left up to public health experts. Um, and so I will always defer to the, um, to the expertise and the advice of Dr. Etchers and other public health experts. Let's base our decisions on science and, and not emotion. Um, one question I do have for Mr. Manconi and his team, if I might. Um, in the present, so I guess I do have a question on the presentation, I lied. In the presentation, uh, you said that there were 106 individuals who had contracted uh, COVID-19. Um, through um, contact tracing, there's the word I was looking for. How many of these contracted the virus through workplace transmission? Thank you, Commissioner, and, and thank you for, uh, I appreciate it, you gave me a note yesterday on that uh, in terms of uh, a heads up. So. Again, I, I spoke to Dr. Etches and uh, I'm not at liberty to get into those details. I can't for, for privacy reasons. And uh, that, that was confirmed by Dr. Etches last night. Uh, I can tell you the following. Every single case uh, is immediately uh, uh, invokes a contact tracing. And we do the many reports that you see, we immediately report out. And then those that are internal facing, non-public facing, we keep records of all that. So you've seen that in the stats in there. Uh, do we have the data on all of that? Yes, I'm not permitted to release that because it starts to get into people's private lives. And uh, so uh, if you if, if you wanna ask Dr. Etches, but I think you'll get the same answer uh, for privacy reasons. And I totally respect that. No, I absolutely respect that as well. And I was trying to figure out a way to ask the question so that you know you could, sort of answer it. And um, I'm always happy to provide a heads up if I think you guys should bring some data to the meeting. So uh, always happy to do that. Um, I'm taking from your answer, you do not have to confirm or deny because they'll put you in a sticky position that we probably have had a couple of cases of workplace transmission. That is, um, it'd be odd if we didn't, to be honest with you, just given that the numbers of workplace transmissions, I mean, at the very beginning of COVID, the office that I worked in had work, had transmission within the workplace. Um, so um, that makes sense. Um, just just a, a comment on that, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and again, we speak about the science and the terms. Um, I'm cautious about this because uh, I'm, I'm learning, as we all are, uh, certain terms mean different things to different people. And uh, workplace transmission versus um, did you get it because you were at work and there were not preventative measures in place 
So it gets very complicated very quickly. And I, again, the contact tracing and the audits from public health uh, are done and we have representation from our health and safety committees and we communicate out to our union and so forth. So um, it's just a caution on, on, on the terminology. For sure. So when I use the, the term, the terminology of workplace transmission, what I mean is, is that the individual who has contracted COVID-19 has been contact traced in through contact tra tracing. They have, we have figured out that they contracted COVID-19 while performing their duty. So while working, so either from a coworker or, or a member of the public, that is, that is what I mean by workplace transmission. Um, but I understand you can't share those numbers and that's fine. Um, so I would be very supportive of Councillor Gower's motion. Um, I do think that uh, Councillor Brockington's potential friendly amendment to do with, um, you know, reiterating to the province that essential workers should be vaccinated. I don't think there's any harm in that. I know the mayor said it on April 9th, but there's no harm in saying it again, just to reiterate in case the premier has forgotten. Um, and so I think that as I said, I'll just reiterate, I think we need to leave decisions about who gets vaccinated and when to the experts. Um, I don't disagree that, that transit workers are, are absolutely are essential workers. We need to do everything we can to, sorry, my cat is biting wires, um, everything we can to, um, to protect them. And you know, from what I understand, OC Transpo is, is putting in measures, as, as Mr. Manconi just said, um, outdoor tents for eating, um, and, and other things uh, to, to protect them and, and is in constant contact, obviously, with Mr. Crabtree. So I have, I have no concerns there, but I just wanna caution this commission that you know, we are not public health experts and we should not be decreeing you know, who should get the vaccine first um, or who is more important. Um, that uh, should be left up to the experts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, next up is uh, Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair. When you look at the uh, technical framework for vaccine distribution, which I understand the province created, they they list the essential workers and they prioritize, prioritize them. There's two phases, first group, second group, and public transit drivers are in the second group. They're going to be part of the cohort that could be still two, two and a half months potentially before they get vaccinated. And I'm, what I'm saying is that's not good enough. Transit Commission, as you rightly point out, we are focused on our personnel. And I'm not saying one group is more important than the other. The message I just want to say today is that essential workers need to be greater priority. And transit workers in particular, who work for OC Transpo, that we are responsible for, we have a duty of care for our employees, we need to speak up. And we need to say these folks are important. The first phase chair, school bus drivers. School bus drivers are part of the first group. They provide almost the same type of service that an OC Transport bus driver does. They're shuttling people from one point to another. And so I think we can make an argument that transit workers should be greater prioritized. I'm in a cohort uh, chair, uh, I'm 45. My cohort was called this week. We, we now get the opportunity to make appointments to be vaccinated. If you look at data, you want to have a data argument. Look at the data for the 40 year old cohort. Um, I think two deaths, uh, low hospitalization, low ICU admission. Um, why do I get priority over people who provide critical essential services to keep our city rolling along? And so uh, that's the statement I want to make. So Councillor Gowers, wording with respect to approaching Dr. Etches, I can support, but there's gotta be a way to send a signal at the same time to the province. They are as engaged, if not more engaged in determining which Ottawa residents and which Ottawa workers get vaccinated and when they're, they're calling the shots in many regards. So I don't know whether we, we can have agree that we just copy the letter to our local MPPs and the Minister of Health and Premier and not, not have a second clause where we're writing a second, second letter. But if we're gonna write a letter to Dr. Etches, I'm okay if we can just copy the letter to our local MPPs, the Minister of Health and Premier. And I'm looking to you to see if that would be friendly, not write a second letter, 
but simply we'll just copy this letter uh, to those folks. Would that be friendly, Chair? Chair, can I respond? Sure, go ahead, Councilor Gower. Um, could I suggest, Councilor or Commissioner Brockington, perhaps copying the letter to the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario um, as the appropriate provincial official to uh, hear our concerns? Since the original letter is going to our Chief Medical Officer in Ottawa, the um, the adjacent on the provincial level would be uh, the Provincial Medical Officer yep. of Health. Uh, that's fine with me, uh, Councilor Gower. Okay, I, I would accept that as a as a friendly. Definitely. Okay, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Gower. Um, I just want to clarify one thing you, you said there, uh, Councillor Brockington. Uh, you highlighted that the province has lowered the age limit down to 40. I think it was Sunday afternoon they did that uh, for anyone wanting the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. And that's a group you see yourself in. But why do you see transit workers not being able to be in that group? It's for any citizen over 40 years is my understanding. So transit workers are in that group and can get the vaccine. Uh, it's just the under 40. And from what I understand from speaking to our uh, local officials is that uh, as soon as there's supply, they intend to lower that age limit further. Maybe uh, uh, Councillor Egwai, if you want to weigh in on that, so make sure that my facts are straight. Can transit workers now, any transit worker over 40 is already eligible for a vaccine, correct? Yeah, no, I, I, I can certainly confirm that part of it, Chair Hubley. The second part, I, I can't speak to what the province might or might not do in terms of further lowering it. But yes, anybody in, in the city, in the province, 40 years and up can currently um, register for AstraZeneca. Uh, I, I wish we'd stop actually saying AstraZeneca. can register for a vaccination. Okay. Um, and uh, against COVID. Um, you know, I saw an interesting comment. Somebody said, you know, when you get your flu shot, do you ask the pharmacist who made the flu shot or mm -hmm. who made your, your, your asthma medication or what have you? And, and the answer is we don't. So yes, anybody over 40 in the province can register at a pharmacy for a vaccination. Thank you for that uh, helpful advice and clarification. Okay, uh, next up was uh, Commissioner, or was that the end, Councillor Brockington, for you? Yeah, I just want to confirm that we will copy the uh, Provincial Medical Officer of Health. I think Councillor Gower said that was friendly, and there's no issue with that, Chair. Right, uh, I, I believe so. We're going to run through this one more time at the end, what we're at with amendments, and we can go from there. I, I, I'll be upfront with you, Councillor Brockington. I really, I think as other commissioners have expressed, have a lot of concern with your suggestion that we change the queuing of uh, who gets the vaccine. So I just wanna see where we land on that. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, to change the pace a little bit, I'd like to go back to the uh, presentation and just a question for Mr. Charter and Mr. Manconi, I'm not sure which one, but uh, I think congratulations are in order. Things seem to be going very, very well. All the issues that have been identified in the past seem to have been addressed or are being addressed. One question I have, are there any emerging issues that you're not telling us or things that are just sort of uh, on the horizon uh, that may become major issues down the road? Is there anything like that that we should be aware of? No new issues. Uh, what uh, a, a major milestone that we've hit, believe it or not, is uh, a portion of the fleet is due for uh, and is in the process of getting major inspections. And I believe it's at the 200,000 kilometer mark. Um, so, um, you know, our trains have been running a lot. Uh, and so um, they're doing the major inspections to them now, along with everything else. And major inspections aren't normally a big deal, but because they've got the wheel issues, they got everything else going on. And that's why we're keeping it at 11 trains. You know, there's low volumes on it and we're taking full advantage of it. So that and a hardcore press, we have pressured them to get, get out and do the uh, track grinding, uh, ballast uh, compaction and so forth, which may result in us wanting to do some shutdown. So they get extended periods of time on the rail. Again, this is the opportune time to do that. So. Uh, the equipment has been booked. It goes around uh, Canada and North America, specialized equipment. And um, those are the two things that uh, Troy and I have been focused uh, on in terms of uh, getting it done. And then, of, of course, is what Troy mentioned, 
the independent review. So the independent review has been done. They like what they see on, on uh, many of the items. Uh, we need to get the track work done before they can sign off on that. And then it's a question of consistency and rhythm. You know, getting to September and, and you know, ridership will come back and making sure they don't slip. And so that's what I'm watching is I don't want them to take any steps backwards on, on, on their work. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. That is my only question. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Olson. Uh, so next up is uh, Councillor Flurry, please. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, John and the team for the update. Uh, my question relates to the motion that's on the floor, and I, I just want to understand it procedurally. If the Transit Commission was to pass the Gower motion today, does it is it referred to Council or does it go from the Commission to... Um, I guess in this case to our medical officer of health, because I, I think, you know, just to preface this, um, I agree with Councillor Kavanaugh without picking essential workers. I think there's a, a, a number of individuals that have continued to work while we're all staying at home. And I think it's danger. I recognize your mandate is within the transit commission. I respect that. And that's why the motion is so specific. I'm not questioning that. I'm wondering if the motion does make its way to council uh, where, where we could bring uh, additional amendments uh, to, uh, to reflect the, the broader uh, sentiment of essential workers that, that, that did come forward on, uh, at Ottawa Public Health, for example. Okay, we can ask staff to uh, weigh in on that. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the way Councillor Gower's motion is worded, it would just be a note going over to the Board of Health. Um, and that we would not be uh, getting into making a list of who's essential workers and, and who should go before or after each one. Uh, Caitlin, could you help us with that? Mr. Mr. Chair, you're correct um, in reviewing with the city clerk, the scope of Councillor Gower's motion, um, including with a mere CC to uh, the province would be uh, a direction that is within the uh, mandate of the Transit Commission. It would of course be within any member's right to bring an additional motion through notice of motion directly to council that is more broad and outside the jurisdiction of the Transit Commission. Thank you, Caitlin. So that answers your question, Councillor Fleur. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I would, I would, I respect the commission's uh, mandate. I, I, I challenge the risk of doing that because I, I see a lot of fragmented ask from, um, from, from different essential workers, but, but I, I do see the importance of advancing uh, essential worker vaccination. So I'll leave it to, to you and the commission to, to, uh, to debate and, and to uh, discuss, but, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll listen in just to see if, if as a member of council, we, uh, we need to, to, to review next week or bring something forward next week. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fleury. And next up is head of the Eastern Bloc, Councillor Tim Turner. <laughs> the head, did I get a promotion? Anyway, thank you so much, uh, uh, Alan. Uh, real quick, uh, first of all, uh, very happy to see the 99%, uh, you know, fingers crossed, uh, we uh, continue that trend. Um, also, I, uh, in the discussions about the plus 40, uh, John, uh, I know we have an internal like uh, online newspaper with OC Transpo. Are we actually sending messages to our operators uh, suggesting or advising them now that shots available if you're over 40? There's a, a, a decent number of plus 40 operators that do a great job out there. Are we letting them know they should take the opportunity and get the vaccination? Forgive me. We have regular communication with them on COVID and we, we have a, a draft message going out uh, right after every transit commission meeting. And, and, and as a matter of fact, part of that is the reminder to go out and if you're uh, in the age category that you're eligible to go out and get it done. Excellent, thanks, John. And while I got you on the hook here, uh, real quick, and I know they're not just for uh, uh, safety uh, protection of our operators. Uh, uh, many of us, almost all of us voted for their protective shields on the buses. Uh, how is that, uh, what's the status of that? Is that moving ahead right now? Yes, uh, you're going to be receiving a memo. Uh, Mr. Greer, uh, credit to him, worked his magic with our procurement folks and we've got an acceleration plan. So April 27th, you're gonna start seeing buses on the road in addition to the 12 that already have them, but you're gonna start seeing the fleet 
in tranches getting done and it'll be done by the end of the summer. Great, thank you so much. So again, uh, I just to echo a lot of the comments that uh, we've heard here today, I'll keep it brief is, um, you, you know, uh, there is uh, the head of our city uh, and don't tell Jim, it's not him. Uh, for the last year, it's been Dr. Etches and she has provided the guidance that has gotten us this far and I fully support and thank you Glenn for modifying the motion I, or putting in a new motion, I should say. I think this really covers all bases and I'll gladly support the Gower motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Tierney. Okay, with uh, no other questions uh, to staff and comments on the motion. So we have Councillor Gower's motion. Would you like to um, read it one more time for us, Councillor Gower, and then we will vote? Well, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just read the therefore be it resolved. Sure. Therefore be it resolved that the Transit Commission direct the chair to write to Ottawa's Medical Officer of Health with a copy to the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario to emphasize the role of public transit workers in enabling essential work to continue in the City of Ottawa and ask that this be shared with the Ottawa Vaccine Sequencing Task Force for their consideration as they undertake the work of sequencing essential workers who cannot work from home, including transit workers. Thank you very much, Councillor Gower. Is that uh, motion carried, Commission? Carried. 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 Thank you. Thank you all for your work on this. Uh, very much appreciate it. So that concludes the update on the Confederation Line service. So item number two is the OC Transport Performance Report for the period ending December 2020. Uh, if uh, I believe Mr. Scringer, you're doing the presentation on this? Yes, I will. Could you uh, go ahead, please? I will. Thanks, Eric. So the this, uh, by way of uh, introduction to background, this is the first of the uh, ongoing series of reports following the um, uh, the process that you laid out for us and reporting on the measures that you approved at your meeting in uh, February. So we'll be reporting on these uh, twice a year and uh, there's much more detail in the report, but I will go through some of the high points here, some of the main, um, uh, main not lessons learned, but main points that the numbers show uh, in this presentation in each of the categories. So the next slide, please, Eric. Uh, there's, the, there's the background I just said. Uh, this, this period that we're reporting on is the 12th month from January 2020 until December 2020. And you'll see in some measures it reaches back further because of the nature of the measure. These are the measures that, uh, that you approved in February and that we're reporting on under the categories of customer safety, ridership, customer service, and service reliability. Next, please. So first of all, under customer safety, the customer injury rate is the, uh, the measure that we, um, we have. This is the number of customer injuries per million trips where that injury required the injured person to be transported to hospital and where that recurred as a, occurred as a result of transit operations or activities. The rate in uh, 2019 was 0 0.8 injuries per million trips. The rate in 2020 was 1.0 per million trips. But we'd like to point out that though the, the rate has gone up in 2020, the number went down considerably in 2020, um, from 83 injuries in the year down to 42 injuries in 2020. All of this is um, a result of the reduced ridership during 2020, giving us a, a lower number of customers on the system and a lower number of customers in the calculation of per million trips. Next slide, please. This uh, shows how that uh, that number, which I gave you a, a whole number for 2019, a whole number for 2020, and this shows how that number has changed over time. This is for each month here. This is a 12-month um, average looking back over the preceding 12 months. So it rose, uh, the number rose basically as ridership declines made more of the um, more of the 12 month. When we get to a, a time when ridership is stable again this number will be much more meaningful than it is this year. Next, please. 
Now, at the last commission meeting, there was discussion and then follow-up discussion with some commissioners uh, about additional uh, aspects which they would like to have seen um, covered under the customer safety category. And so we're recommending two additional measures, having heard and talked with those commissioners and having looked to uh, what data are available to us and what data we can be confident on their, um, their um, applicability and uh, that, that we calculate them consistently. Consistently, The first is that we can report on crime rate on the transit system. This would be reported as the, the total number of criminal code offenses per 100,000 customer trips. Uh, if you agree with this, this is one of the recommendations in the report, we can start reporting on that in our next um, and twice annual report later in the year. The second is that, that, as I mentioned, the injuries that we're reporting in the customer injury rate uh, are those that required transportation to hospital. We were asked by a number of commissioners to find a, a lower level to re be able to record and report on uh, injuries that were less severe than that. All of our injuries under our safety management system are coded as a level one, two, three, four, or five. The number that uh, we reported to you just uh, two slides earlier is injuries at levels three, four, and five added together. Those are the levels at which uh, transport to hospital was required. We can, in addition to that, add the level two injuries. These will be less severe injuries. These are the ones where uh, the injury was reported and required treatment by paramedics, but did not require transport to hospital. That is uh, the additional one that we can recommend to you. And that's part of our recommendations. The next slide, please. Now in the category of ridership, we report on the total number of link trips. That's a complete journey from home to work, work to home, school to shopping, whatever a complete trip is. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as we've been talking about for quite some time now, led to significantly lower ridership in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, and when we com completed the calendar year 2020, we were at 40 and a half million customers for the year, um, quite a bit lower than in 2019 when we were at uh, about 96 million. So the next slide will show the month by month ridership with the blue bar being the ridership in 2019. And you can see the normal seasonal reductions there as um, summer comes and fewer people are going to work in school returning in the fall. You can also see in the orange bars that ridership in the first two months of 2020 was higher than it had been a year earlier and then started to decline during March as the pandemic came to Ottawa and then reached its low point uh, from April to June and then started rising up to September and then remained fairly steady. We've seen this number in, uh, in other places before. The next slide, please. We will be reporting on ridership per capita. We can't report the 2020 number yet because we don't have it for uh, the other municipalities across the country, but we can show you the ridership per capita uh, in a, in, uh, across the country in the preceding years in 2019 and 2018. And then the next slide. And you can see here that our ridership per capita is the highest in the country after Montreal and Toronto, uh, higher than, slightly higher than Vancouver, Edmonton, and Calgary. Uh, with Edmonton and Calgary being our closest direct comparators. Uh, this number is not consistently uh, indicative or reliable of, of exactly the situation in any city uh, because it counts all the ridership as compared to the number of people who live in that municipality. Uh, as you can imagine, in Toronto and Montreal, many, many of the people who are traveling on the, the uh, TDC or the STM are people who are traveling from outside uh, the boundaries of the city of Toronto and the city of Montreal. Uh, it, that happens to a lesser extent in Ottawa uh, because we have some people who are traveling on our system but live in places like Gatineau, Carleton Place. Um, it uh, doesn't happen so much in, uh, in uh, Vancouver where their territory is quite extensive, uh, but that's a, that's a uh, something that we can't control in these calculations that Toronto and Montreal, because they're, they're um, uh, much more metropolitan, will always show up higher than, uh, than the other 
cities in the country. Next, please. Paratranspo ridership, um, like like the ridership on the conventional system had increased in January and February 2020, and then declined sharply after that uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, in the year, we carried a total of 389,000 customer trips. The next slide, please. So you can see here uh, in the left, there's, there's pairs here. The left column shows 2019, the right shows 2020, and you can see the very sudden drop there through through March from February to April, and then the slight increase. The colors in the vertical bar are uh, the number of trips that were requested and the number of trips that were completed. Uh, the trip requests is the, uh, the, the two bars added together. Some of those trips, as you can see, a relatively constant uh, proportion were canceled uh, by the customer after the booking it had been made because their you know, their, their uh, health didn't permit them to travel or travel needs changed. Um, so the, the height of the bar shows the number of requests that came in. The height of the blue bar shows the number of uh, trips that were, were provided. There's also a number that is invisible on this chart, and that's the number of uh, trips where we had to decline a request. If there had been any of those, uh, they would show up as a, a green bar. I believe in the year 2020, we had eight of those for the entire year where um, we just didn't have the capacity to carry one person. So that's a, a big change from previous years and a, a, a big result of the commission devoting additional uh, resources to additional capacity on the paratranspo system. The next, please. Now we move on to customer service um, where we're gonna show you the, the number of contacts that customers have had with our customer service representatives through various channels. Uh, those contacts were were up in January and February, and then were down for the rest of the year once uh, uh, corresponding to the ridership going down. Uh, the next slide shows uh, how those contacts were. You can see that we had um, higher results, and then as ridership went down, there's fewer people contacting us for information. The next, please. The Another uh, measure that we have is the average time to answer an inquiry. These are all phone calls of various types added together. The average time that someone waited on the phone uh, before they reached the customer service representative. And what you'll see here on the next slide is in blue, you can see the numbers that we were um, having in 2019 where some waits were on average greater than half an hour. In fact, some greater than 40 minutes. Uh, but what you can see in January and February before the pandemic hit is how much lower we were doing where the average wait was down to less than 10 minutes. That's a result of the major investment made by council and the commission into um, our customer service operation. Uh, so you can see that that, that uh, reorganization and that extra investment was bearing fruit immediately. And then you, you can't see it anymore because what goes on from April to December is just uh, the result of fewer calls because of the lower ridership, because of uh, less travel being made because of the pandemic. The next slide, please. Service availability uh, represents the um, amount of planned service that was delivered. Um, this is the, you know, the, what some people consider the uh, cancellations or, you know, undelivered trips. And uh, during 2020, uh, we were able to deliver more service. We were at twenty. Uh, we were at ninety-seven percent in twenty nineteen. So three percent of trips, three percent of hours uh, undelivered. And in twenty nineteen, we were up to ninety-eight point three. So just one point seven percent undelivered. The next slide, please. There's a, a graph showing it by mode. Twenty nineteen on the left. Twenty twenty on the right. Um, you can see. Um, the bus going up from 97 to 98.4. You can see O-Train Line 1 going down from 97.4 to 95.2, uh, noting that O-Train Line 1 was only um, operational for a few months in 2019. And that number is uh, completely reflective of the same numbers that you've seen from Troy, Troy Charters. On O-Train Line 2, we were at 99.5% in 2019. 99.9% in those first uh, four or five months in 2020 that line two was open. And then when you combine everything together, 
uh, all the conventional services, 97% and 98.3, as I mentioned earlier. The next slide, please. Excess wait time is, uh, you may recall, it's our, our measure uh, of uh, additional time that customers need to wait more than they would expect to due to uneven spacing of frequent services. This is how we report on the punctuality of all of our services that operate every 15 minutes or more frequently, includes all train service and frequent uh, and rapid bus services. Um, the summary number down at the bottom is that uh, on buses, on the frequent routes, customers on average waited 9% longer than, than planned and 4% longer on O-Train Line 1. The next slide shows it in, in numbers. Um, on frequent bus routes, uh, people were in January and February waiting less than a minute longer than expected, about 30 seconds longer. That grew in March, April, and May, and then was down again in June, July, August, September. The numbers in March, April, and May will definitely be affected by the fact that we had uh, temporarily reduced service during those months. Um, you can see for frequent services, the uh, unreliability uh, or the excess weight can be higher in some months than the rapid services. And that would be the nature of uh, operating on arterial roads versus running on transitway. Next slide, please. On time performance, we report for uh, services that run less than every 15 minutes, so every 16 minutes or less frequently. Uh, this is the percentage of trips that left major stops along the route no more than one minute early and no more than five minutes after the scheduled time. Um, and you'll see on the next slide that um, we, uh, that it's between 70 and 80% of all um, all of these services operated on time. And you can also see that the number of trips that operated early increased as traffic uh, declined on the uh, road network. So there's uh, fewer, um, fewer cars on the road, fewer customers on board, more of a chance of bus running early as in as much as the operators have tried to not run early. Sometimes the um, the, the pressure of traffic carries carries that with you. Sometimes the, you, you need to move through the light to not uh, stay in a, an unsafe location on the road. Uh, so we, um, one of the service changes that's in effect just this week is, uh, is a reduction in um, scheduled travel time on a number of routes, many routes across the system to uh, reflect the current conditions, which should bring down the number of trips that are running early. We'll see that in the next report. And you can see the number of trips that are running late. Um, once, uh, once we were past the winter has been pretty consistently less than 10% of trips. Next slide, please. On-time performance for paratranspo service. Uh, the definition here is that paratranspo customers are quoted a 30 minute window uh, when they would like their trip to arrive. And uh, we measure uh, how often uh, we met that that uh, 30 minute window and that's higher in 2020. We got that up from 89% uh, to 94%. Next slide, please. And there's a graph month by month showing how uh, on-time performance has been consistently higher in 2020, including in the months before the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, on accessibility, we report on elevator avail availability, the percentage of time that an elevator is available for service uh, for stations that have a second elevator, which was built for that redundancy. Uh, it's if either of those elevators is there. Um, and that's, that's why those second elevators were built. At transitway stations, which mostly have uh, only a single elevator, we were at 98% in both uh, 2020 and 2019. And uh, at O-Train Line 1 stations, most of which have two elevators, all of which have a, a redundant accessible path, we were at effectively 100%, meaning we were closer to 100 than we were to 99.9. .9. The next slide, please. There's the, the number across the system. You can see slightly lower in August, but very, very high uh, across the full year. 
Next slide, please. So uh, we have the report in front of you today, which includes all of this for information, plus the recommendations of the two additional measures based on the discussions from February. Uh, we will uh, take the direction um, you give us on those recommendations. We'll present our next report to you in the fall. And that report will be to cover the 12 months from January 20, from July 2020 until June 2021. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Scrimger. Merci énormément de, de votre travail. Um, questions by uh, commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Wright, please. Thank you very much. I just have a few questions. Um, so you mentioned that you had discussed with various commissioners about uh, additional uh, performance measures. I was one of those commissioners, um, as I had raised at our last commission meeting with respect to this, um, two commission meetings ago? time is blending. Um, with respect to this report, uh, specifically with respect to customer safety, and my concern was that the performance metrics were not capturing um, perhaps um, feelings, uh, how customers could feel unsafe, but not necessarily would not capture it through uh, the metrics with respect to did they get injured. Um, so when we had our discussion, my suggestion was that uh, we would use the metrics that, of our own data with respect to customers reporting to OC Transpo through the online data that we receive through a reporting form uh, that they have felt harassed or unsafe. I noticed that that's not included in this um, in these recommendations. Um, could I know why that wasn't included? Commissioner, as we discussed at the time, our, and our recommendation is as we as we talked about that uh, the crime rate uh, is our consistent way of reporting on that to make sure that it uh, it captures um, what occurred on the system and what um, uh, the, and is recorded consistently and can be compared equally from year to year. Uh, so that is our recommendation that the crime rate includes all crimes against property and crimes against persons and uh, that um, uh, assaults, harassment and things like that uh, are recorded in that number. Right, but harassment. So harassment against persons of color, against women, LGBTQ individuals, those are typically underreported, first of all, by individuals. Second of all, in my experience, uh, are not usually charged uh, under the criminal code. And so my question is, since we have this data, it's our data, we have it, it's our reporting form, why are we not including this when customers are using our reporting form to come forward and say, I was, I felt unsafe, I felt harassed. Um, they didn't necessarily call the police. They didn't necessarily report it to an OC Transpo uh, special constable. However, they're reporting it to us. And I think that if we want that reporting system to be, to be used and for customers to feel like we actually care about their safety, I think that we need to include this metric in our uh, in our report performance reporting measures, so that I don't disagree with it with the criminal code charges, though I think that number is going to be incredibly low. Um, I just think that we're missing um, a piece of the picture here, the contextual picture picture in terms of people reporting that they feel unsafe when it comes to customer safety on our transit system. Uh, as we talked about it in February, I, th I think uh, we talked about very similar points. Um, you have our recommendations, and um, if there's additional motions that uh, any commissioner wants to put forward, then the commission would be uh, able to consider it. Okay. All right, then. Um, talking about the average customer wait time to speak with a customer service representative. Uh, the previous time in 2019 uh, was 47 minutes, which I think we can all agree is ridiculously long. Um, in 2020, the wait time decreased rapidly, given that you know there were less people riding uh, the system, and I think that you had made some staffing adjustments as well. Um, so, when our ridership increases and therefore our call volumes increase, um, are there any additional measures being taken to ensure that we do not reach that uh, 47 minutes or higher number? I mean, for me, it, it would make sense if our if our target for answering customers' calls was less than five minutes. Um, any longer than five minutes on hold and I'm losing my mind personally. So I'm wondering what's being done to ensure that we can answer our customers' calls promptly. 
So there's a number of things we're doing. The first is, of course, what you see reflected there in the January and February numbers, the, the great and immediate result uh, that came from um, the Commission and Council uh, giving us the resources to hire more staff, um, which came, went along with us reorganizing uh, how that staff is administered just to, to um, uh, effectively administer the, the larger uh, workforce. So you see those numbers uh, very quickly happening following the uh, implementation of the 2020 budget uh, with the decisions that were made. The work on that area has continued um, and so we're well placed when ridership comes back to uh, no longer uh, have the long waits that we had previously. The second is that um, we're providing more and more opportunity for people to um, enter into transactions with us or get their information electronically. One of the big, uh, the biggest source of calls to OC Transpo is paratranspo bookings. Uh, we've got the ability now for people to book trips online and we've got uh, more of that coming in the months to come with the, uh, with the full, full set of online services that are coming. So that plus the other work we're doing uh, to make it easier for people to get people get information electronically, to get all the information they're looking for us on one contact rather than multiple, um, will uh, with end with the continued uh, uh, support from council on uh, on keeping the 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 number of uh, customer service representatives high enough to uh, keep that weight low. So that should all we're we're very well placed uh, for when ridership returns. So you mentioned that uh, that the highest uh, majority of calls is, is from customers booking paratransport trips. I did note that in the report. Remind me, can customers cancel their paratransport trips online as well? Yes, they can. Okay, perfect. Um, and finally, uh, just moving to on-time performance for buses, it's reported at 72 to 79%. What's the goal for on-time performance? What's the number we're trying to reach? I mean, 100% be fantastic, but not realistic. So, so what's, the, what's the realistic goal we're trying to reach? There's, there's two, two. One is 100%. We will always try to be 100%. And, we, and the other is we will always try to be better than we were uh, the previous reporting period or the previous day. We'll always try to move the number up and we'll always try to get it closer to 100%. We're, um, we don't recommend setting an ambition that we that would imply that we would uh, take attention away from it when we achieve something that is less than 100%. So you would agree that 72 to 79% of on-time performance is not exactly um, peak performance? It's not 100% and we want to continuously improve the service we offer to our customers. But remember that um, on-time performance of bus service is not exclusively about uh, decisions made at OC Transpo. It uh, is affected also by uh, you know, the design of the city, the design of the roads, the behavior of people on the roads, um, and the, the random nature of things that occur across the city that would cause delays to um, to uh, all road operation and not just bus operation. That's that's a fair point. And I think it is something that, uh, that you know, we do definitely do need to keep in mind, but then, you know, uh, sort of put that into context. You know, the design of the OC Transpo transit system is absolutely within OC Transpo's control um, and where the buses are run and, and what roads they run on at what times. And so I think that, you know, contextually speaking, I think we need to put that uh, put that uh, in there as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are my questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Vice Chair Cloutier, who's uh, the next speaker? I have Counts uh, Commissioner Brockington, uh, Mr. Chair. There you go. Uh, can you text me the list uh, while Council Brockington's talking, please? Absolutely. Sorry, Commissioner, I had to step away for to make a quick phone call. To, thanks. Problem, Chair. Go thank ahead, Dr. Brock. Thank you. Um, Mr. Scrimger, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see data. It's been a long time coming, and uh, it's a good first start. Um, I do want to repeat some of the, the issues that commissioners raised as we were talking about this uh, back in February, and I'll start with the, the customer injury data. 
your data only incorporates people who required ambulatory care. And I mentioned it's a better metric to, to incorporate injuries that all injuries, as opposed to the more serious ones that required ambulatory care. Do you have that data? And the reason why I'm asking for this is because it's good to know um, injuries that are reported so that we can track them. And I think the issue we gave is whether it's slippery stairs or some frequent chronic ongoing matter that the Transit Commission uh, can better understand. But your thoughts on this matter, please. So our recommendation is that uh, to respond to that request for more detailed information that we report on the the injuries that are coded as level two. Those are uh, injuries that are reported and which required a, uh, a paramedic to attend and, and uh, give assistance. Uh, the level two are the ones that did not require transport to, uh, to hospital. This number we can be sure is consistent from year to year, is consistent across um, all parts of the transit network uh, because it involves the, um, the degree of reporting and the degree of uh, it, involve, it requires that the, the, the injury be reported and requires that the injury um, have required uh, some, uh, some limited medical attention. The ones that are coded as level one, we will not be able to be certain that they're consistently reported. We're not going to be able to be certain that they're consistently reported among different groups of customers, different parts of the system over time. Uh, we don't know if somebody um, slips and falls, bumps their knee, gets up and keeps walking, whether they're going to call in or not, whether it's whether they're going to say something to a supervisor. They might say something if a supervisor is right there. They might not say something if, uh, if they just uh, walk to work and, um, and uh, have experienced it but didn't, didn't tell us about it. So we, we don't believe that we can report to you any consistent figures at the level one on our scale of one, two, three, four, five. Do you classify each level of injury by how they got injured? It's recorded and uh, recorded for, um, you know, what is the nature of the injury? It goes into the database and, uh, you know, the, the different types of injuries um, would also um, illustrate where attention needs to be given in changing operational procedures. Okay, fair enough. Um, Mr. Scrimger, at this February meeting, I gave direction to staff that, um, that staff be directed to add the following as a reliability metric under two separate headings, train and bus, three pieces of data, on time, late and canceled. I think you've covered on time and late. Have you touched upon the canceled routes, that data element? Yes, we have. Uh, I will just uh, pull up the report and take you to the page. Okay. Uh, table six on page 23 of my document. Uh, table five and table six. These are the uh, the figures that respond to the direction you provided. So in table five for O-Train line one, you can see the percent of service not delivered being high in January, February, and July, lower during the rest of the year. And in table six uh, for busts, you can see the percent service not delivered uh, reaching a high of 4% in March. And um, over to the right, you can see the excess wait time versus the um, on-time performance for the less frequent services. Okay, just uh, my final question, just to piggyback on one counselor, sorry, Commissioner Wright Gilbert asked, and that's regarding table four on the previous page, page 22, on-time bus performance by month and time period. I am surprised, I will admit, that the um, on-time performance of the buses once COVID started, once the traffic volumes were way down, once you know there wasn't a crush of transit riders, was still in the 75, 80% range during peak service. Can you talk about why that is? Well, what happened, and we, we've looked at the numbers and we've seen it across the system, is buses that were previously late were able to run on time, buses that were on time started to run early. 
we started to see much more trips running early. I think um, you can see that on figure 15 on page 21. You can see the blue bar uh, for trips that are running early being, you know, 50% by December, we were almost double what it had been in January. And uh, those early running trips can be um, addressed in a number of ways. And one of those ways that's come into effect with the April service change this week is we've uh, reduced the running time. Um, but early running trips cause uh, problems for customers because they go by uh, ahead of when the, the customer is ready for it to, but it also they also cause operational problems. You may have seen, if you've been traveling on the system, you may, be in some, may have seen some of our main operational points like Tiny's Pasture Station or um, uh, downtown with just buses piling up because they're getting there so early they're just they're they're taking up a lot of space and uh, so it's a lot of work for our, our operational staff to manage the buses that are running early and in many cases it's a lot of work for our uh, operators to need to explain to customers why they're waiting at a stop and not going through when the light turns green because once the customer's on board they want to keep moving i gotta tell you i have not been on a bus in about 25 years that during its run pulled over just to make sure it it allowed the schedule to catch up to himself because it was right uh, it was ahead of schedule so it's it's a different phenomenon. Just just to clarify, if a bus is more than a minute ahead of schedule, that's considered not on time. It's coded as not on time. Correct. If it's okay. a minute, if it's uh, if it's a minute ahead of published time to five minutes after published time, we count it in these tables as on time. If it's more than a minute ahead, it's counted as early. If it's more than five minutes after, we count it as late. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I'll park the rest of my questions for now. Thank you again for this data. Oh, just I one final question. The, you have a notes at the last slide that said you're coming back, you would present a year's worth of data, but our, once we get caught up, is it gonna be six month intervals of data? We'll report to you every six months, and in every case, we'll report to you on the preceding twelve months. So there'll be an overlap. You know, we'll, oh, okay. we'll report. We'll report here, 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 yeah. here. Okay. That way, you've always got in every report that comes, you see the full effect of seasonality over the full year, and you won't see, um, you know, winter driving some numbers up and summer driving some okay. numbers up. We'll always give you a, a full year, the, the most recent twelve months. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Next up is uh, Commissioner Caracato, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is great. Agree with the two previous commissioners. Uh, it's really nice to see some data that we can compare and and get a clear picture, I guess, of what's happening across the system, both on the bus and the train and para, of course. Um, my question refers back to page 23 um, tables five and six and kind of speaks broadly I guess to my point um, data is great but analysis is even better and I feel like uh, there is a like a lot a lack of analysis throughout this report um, that if it were provided would eliminate a lot of the questions um, we're facing today. Um, for example, on table five, I'm just going to focus on January and February pre pandemic service, not delivered 11.6% uh, in January, 10.4% in February. Um, can you explain, I guess, some of the reasons why the bus would be late, um, 10% of the time? Is it traffic or weather or lack of drivers detours? I'm sorry, Commissioner, are you talking about line table five? Table five, page 23. Table five is about O-Train line one. Yeah, uh, sorry for the train and then I'll get to the bus later. Service not delivered. Um, you know, you get monthly reports on that from Troy about the problems that we experienced in that that winter. Um, this These numbers are exactly the same as the numbers that uh, Troy has shown you monthly on... on uh, the reliability, the service delivered, um, and you know the the um, 
the causes for that are all are all enumerated in those uh, monthly reports that you've been receiving. Uh, we can say more here in future, but um, this is this is at this point year old information that I I perhaps I over assumed that we were all familiar with the problems that we'd had with um, all of those aspects, um, all the all the measures that require remediation on uh, on the O train system. Okay, then we'll skip to table six, then where it's the bus performance. Um, Commissioner, if I can help out on that, just uh, if you recall, um, we can bring up the slide if you like. Uh, January and February of last year was those very difficult months on L LRT where we had the arcing and the power issues on, on the rail. Uh, but your point is well taken. Uh, you know, again, this is all new to the commission and, and I, I'm hearing what all the commissioners are saying is perhaps we need a bit more uh, narrative around some of these things and we're happy to take that back. This is an evolution for us. And so this feedback is, is spot on because uh, Pat and I want to hear about this so that we can bring these reports. I like the dialogue because it's about you know, accountability and how we can improve and the quest, as Pat says, we're striving for 100%, but we got to connect some dots. So um, this is good. Uh, all the feedback is very, very helpful from all the commissioners. But uh, just to answer your question there, I'm just looking at the graph right now. Those were those two very difficult, brutal months on, on LRT where we had the arcing and the power and vehicle availability issues. Great. Yeah, no, th that's sort of where I was going is just some more narrative, some more analysis of the data so that, you know, first of all, I don't have to ask as many questions and other commissioners don't, but it, it's also more clear to the general public who are reading this and may not have the same context or remember Troy's report from a few months ago. Um, so if we can improve that in the future, that'd be great. Um, and on that point, I guess, table six, the buses in January and February were, I guess, let's say 16% of the time they were late. And, you know, just looking for some context, is that, you know, detours? Is it weather related? Is it a lack of staffing and drivers? Um, and you may, you may not know that right now, and I don't, you know, want to belabor the point, but just if, if in future you can kind of provide us with some more of that context, that'd be really good. And we will. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I, I think we will, um, we will know more perhaps two years from now. We'll have to see what, uh, you know, winter of 2021 will have been quite a bit different than winter 2022. When we go back to the beginning of, sorry, 2020, these numbers are the first time we've measured during this uh, since, um, yeah. since uh, O-Train Line 1 opened, since all the bus routes were changed, uh, since, and then during this period, you've got the, the improvements, the, the second round of improvements that were made to the bus routes. Uh, so we don't, I, I wouldn't want to say that those are normal. I can just say that that's what we experienced during January and February pre-pandemic. Then you can see the numbers changed in character quite a bit from April on as uh, more of the lates were replaced by earlies. Uh, and that was fairly consistent through the year. Uh, we're continuing to manage our pandemic related operations right now. Um, so there, it will just be, it will be hard to say what is normal and what is, um, what is a trend and what is transient for a, a couple of months or a, or a season. Um, okay. over time we will build up more knowledge in this area and we'll be able to uh, reflect on it better in future reports. Yeah, that's great. I mean, obviously weather's outside of our control, but if there are things within our control that we can change to reduce the time that people are waiting, I think that's the whole goal of this exercise. Um, yeah, that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Caricato. Next up is uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, thank you to staff um, for the report. Um, one of the things I wanted to raise was already discussed with, um, with Councillor um, Gilbert Wright um, is the concern about safety. Um, and for women, um, it's, it's, um, I, I'm wondering about um, reports on harassment um, um, by women on transit or for anybody for that matter. Um, 
And um, if we have any statistics on it's one of the top concerns we hear about um, as a liaison on women and gender equity, I hear safety is, is the number two issue of housing, of course, first. Um, and um, I, I think it's really important for us to make our transit system feel as safe as possible. And are we, how are we collecting reports of on, on harassment when people feel they've been harassed and they've made reports? So I want to draw, draw a distinction here between um, our, uh, you know, responding to problems as they occur, responding to trends as they occur, which all does occur, and reporting on the performance of the transit system um, in, in this way as, the, um, as guided by the, the working group of commissioners. So on the first, every, uh, we have many ways that uh, customers can report ways that they've um, felt unsafe or been harassed or um, uh, had a bad experience. Uh, we, they can do that by calling. They can do that by um, uh, reporting online. Uh, they can do that in a number of ways. And our um, special constable team, along with Ottawa Police Service, follows up on all of those. And, uh, uh, and if there's any um, if there's ever anything that we can change about our operations to uh, improve customers' feeling of safety uh, or actual safety, um, anything that is uh, broad, that where we can uh, can do something that uh, that will will help everybody, we'll always build that into our um, operational plans. I'll give an example of one of those. Um, uh, following uh, some analysis a few years ago of uh, where people felt unsafe. We now buy our bus shelters with a, a translucent roof, which allows more light from the street to uh, fall into the, into the bus shelter. It's a slightly higher cost to put a, um, a translucent roof than a, a solid metal roof, uh, slightly higher maintenance, but it was a decision that um, that we made to change the standards, and that that's a, a thing that you know we took from um, what people were experiencing, how people were feeling, um, and where they where they didn't feel safe. Now that's um, that's about response, whether it's response to an incident or response to to a trend. The other is performance reporting, where we're trying to report on how did the transit service perform in all of these ways, customer safety customer service, on-time performance, accessibility. These are all um, countable things, which we can know that we're reporting on consistently over time. They reflect uh, countable outcomes of uh, aspects of the transit system. What they don't include is um, feelings about the transit system. They don't include things like do I, you know, how many people say they feel safe or unsafe? How many people say they are satisfied or dissatisfied? Um, that's, that's a, um, how many people wish for more, wish for less? How many people would like uh, more service? How many people would like lower fares? How many, you know, if some of these things you might find 100% agreement with some, some general wishes about the transit system. And those... <laughs> May, those may not be consistent over time and they may not reflect, they, they are connected with, but they may not directly reflect how the transit system is performing. So the recommendations that we brought to you in February were developed with the assistance of the working group of councillors. The two additional measures that uh, we're recommending uh, here in this report today are with the further discussion that we had with some commissioners uh, following the February meeting. Um, we always want to caution you to consider what it is that you want to know, what it is that you will do with the information, and how can we be sure that we're giving you the information that's most important to you as you make your policy decisions and plan for the future, and uh, that we're not overwhelming you with um, 20, 25 measures, trying to keep it down to the, the 10 or a dozen or something like that, that are most important to the Transit Commission? Well, I think this is important. Um, and I'm wondering about if we keep statistics on people reporting they've been harassed on, on our system. Um, 
so uh, that that's that's something that we we should be able to look at. This is the kind of thing that will keep ridership down if if people do not feel safe. Um, it's not just feelings. It's um, these these are these are realities, and um, there may be statistics. If you you were saying that uh, if we have reports of of people being harassed, um, we we should know um, about that. Um, it's it's something that um, we need to look at uh, to uh, to build for the future, um, and and I'm hoping it's solvable. It's not, um, you know, it, it's a metric that um, we need to know about, and and we can certainly work with groups that if um, even if we you know in terms of the what they're hearing. Um, so it's it's reality because that things really do happen. It's not just um, uh, how they feel, but it's how they've been treated um, and it's not necessarily by the staff I'm talking about, but um, if there's issues like that, I, I think that there's, we need to uh, find out about it. So I'm one, we can work together on this. Um, I'm, I can talk to you more about this offline, um, but I think we should reach out to groups and, and hear about those kinds of concerns if you're willing to do that. We, we're certainly willing to do that. Um... And uh, you know our, our our reticence is on what numbers can we uh, report consistently so that you can make decisions from them um, with other groups with experience and how to do that. Uh, we'd certainly be um, you know we'd welcome any opportunity to to learn more and to uh, give you more options for the future. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's not the same as um, I broke my arm because you know I fell off the bus. This is this is about, uh, but there there's some pain here, and um, and concern, and um, we need to get to it if it's because it's real, and um, I I think that we can if we can work together on it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Uh, next up is Commissioner Olson, please. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stranger, on uh, slide five, you talk about injuries per million passenger trips. The, it shows uh, kind of a very flat rate until May, and then the rate actually increases to October, and which seems counterintuitive. You would think that there would be more injuries in, in bad weather, but it seems in the summer months that it's, there are more injuries. Any explanations for that? Uh, well, it's two aspects here. First is that this is uh, the way we've presented what's on slide five is not uh, the injuries that occurred during that month. It's the injuries that occurred in the preceding 12 months ending in that month. So it's a 12 month rolling average and it includes, therefore it, it because it includes um, all 12 months, it will include always, it'll always include a January, it'll always include an August. Uh, so the intent there is that in normal times we will be able to see uh, seasonality aside how our trends changing what happened during 2020 however is that our ridership reduced dramatically down to a sixth of where it would normally be during March and so the the ratio changed both top and bottom of the ratio changed the number of injuries fell the number of injuries but the number of per million, the number of uh, million customer trips being made also fell. So the ratio changed on both sides. This is not a measure that that uh, works during a time uh, of such rapid change in the use of the transit system as we had last year, because uh, we've we've never had uh, any of the months last year. We've never had a month like them before. Uh, we might be able to compare May 2021 to May 2020, but we've never had any month before that was like May 2020 or August 2020. Um, so the, the number of injuries on the transit system fell, but not at as fast a rate as the total ridership on the transit system fell. And that um, may be, but we cannot be sure, that may be the result of um, uh, just what are the types of trips that are still being made? What are the times of day? What are the conditions under which trips are still being made on the transit system uh, during that period? Uh, during the, you know, the, the, the three quarters of 
2020 that were affected by the pandemic. Okay, thank you, Mr. Scrimger. With respect to the, the safety performance measure, um, reporting on the crime rate, it seems a, a very broad or high level measure. Uh, in that regard, there, there are many things that can be considered that are considered criminal offenses. And what you're capturing in the raid is, is I, I assume, you're capturing offenses against property, so vandalism. You're capturing uh, theft. You're also capturing assaults and even more serious crimes. I think the, the, what passengers want, and this echoes what Councillor Kavanaugh said, I mean, the first thing that we're responsible for is, is a safe transit system that's, that's of prime importance to, to passengers to arrive somewhere safely and to be safe on the, on the system. Is there, is there any way, uh, without revealing sensitive inf information, for example, that we could shed light on the, the number and what kinds of safety related incidents, for example, that special constables respond to every year that may address the, the concerns that Councillor Kavanaugh and others have, have raised as well to actually be able to drill down into the data a little bit rather than saying the crime rate went up or the crime rate went down. If it goes up or down, we'll have to say, well, fix it, or it looks like it's going great. But that one data point may actually hide a lot of very interesting and uh, necessary information. Is, is there a way to add that kind of information? So, I mean, uh, Mr. Chair, generally, yes, there is a way those information do exist. And, uh, and, and I'm certain we can find a way to present them um, without, um, without any um, uh, privacy problems. What I don't know for sure is whether, um, is whether they'll all be calculable in a way that can be compared from year to year. Um, when you get to things that happen only a few times during a year, and you know, we'd hope that um, any serious type of crime only happens very infrequently, it's very difficult to make them, you know, we can, we can give a number, X number of things happened. Uh, but if, if one more happens the preceding month or one less happens the preceding month, that might not be the nature or might not be the result of any conscious decision that or, or intent that the Transit Commission or staff made, but it might just be the nature of timing that something happened or it didn't happen or it happened in greater number when something was going on or it happened in lesser number when something else was going on. It would be hard for us to put a a story around these numbers and tell you that there's an ongoing trend. They are numbers that um, that exist in the in the uh, records management system. We will do some work to find out and to be sure that we're um, uh, reporting them in a way that's consistent with how other law enforcement agencies, including Ottawa Police Service, do report them. Um, and we'll we'll come back to you with. Um, you know, cautions if necessary on how you don't want to chop it down too fine and say this particular type of criminal code offense in this month, in this year, because the numbers might be so small that they're hard to, to draw an ongoing picture from. Um, yeah, the, I think the criminal, the criminal, the, the crime rate that we mentioned here is something that we know we can uh, produce. We know that it is. Uh, you know, for the last couple of years has been consistently recorded and reported. We'll be able to give a, an ongoing trend. You'll be able to see that it's constant or that it's going up or that it's going down. And it'll, in addition, be comparable to, uh, you know, what is the crime rate across the entire community and not just on the transit system. The finer we chop these measurements down, the harder it's going to be for us to give that consistent picture, which allows you to, um, to look back and to uh, think about the future. I agree, Mr. Scrimger. I, I just think that passengers will are owed, I guess, a little more information about whether or not they, they should feel safe. And I know that feelings are not facts. I understand that entirely, but 
they will give some indication of how, how customers feel and whether something is, is a trend, whether it's getting worse, whether it's getting better, where resources should be allocated to, to address an issue. If there's a problem with vandalism, it's different than addressing a problem with sexual harassment or assault. So to the extent that any more information, again, and I, I come back to the special constables, if even we can be told uh, on an annual basis what kind of safety related incidents special constables were asked to respond to and the, and the number, we wouldn't get into privacy concerns or anything like that, but we would over time be able to see whether things were, um, whether that's on a per 100,000 trip basis or not, we'd be able to see trends, see whether things were improving or staying the same or, or what have you. So I'd be happy to have more uh, conversations in this regard. I, I hope that there's something that we can do rather than just relying, as I say, on that big uh, sort of overall broad measure. We can do it. Uh, you know, the, the, the headline reporting number that we're recommending is the overall crime rate. But as you can see, for all of the measures that um, we reported on this term where the where the head measure is is a rate. We've given a lot of discussion, a lot of more detail on what makes up that, and that um, allows us to tell the story each each reporting period as um, as it reflects the interests of or as it reflects what we saw, and uh, we can reflect on what uh, what commissioners are, are asking about at the time. If we can. Um, if you can leave it with us that we will provide more detail under the heading of crime rate to say we have the crime rate, which is made up of these types of things. Uh, but the number that we would track over years would be that, um, that top line number. If that would work, we'll certainly um, do that in our next report. Now, the other thing I will say is it's possible that some of these uh, measures will only be reportable like the... Um, uh, like the per capita ridership might only be reportable once per year because they might be added up for a calendar year rather than month by month by month. So Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll certainly undertake to do that additional work and provide Thank you. more of a breakdown of what's, what makes up that, uh, that crime statistic. Okay. okay thank, thank you, Mr. Scrimger. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. And uh, yeah, just to, Sum that up, uh, Mr. Scrimger, there's been some very good feedback about the reports. I think we all recognize that there hasn't been any reporting for uh, several years now. So this is a huge first step for us to get a start reporting. And this was always the intent was to get feedback from the commission itself on where they would like to see more detail and for you to take that away and see what you can do with it. Um, Mr. Manconi, uh, I take it you're in agreement that we can uh, look at uh, massaging these reports uh, based on the input from the commission? Yes, Chair, I, I'm hearing a couple of themes. I think uh, more information around what, what the indicator is, is, is uh, demonstrating uh, to you, our commission. Um, and then I'm hearing uh, there is um, an appetite for a sediment report. What, what do customers feel about our service? What do they uh, um, believe? And it's not a survey. We used to do surveys. Uh, those days are gone. It's it's more uh, um, it's more um, prescriptive than that. And you need to layer the equity inclusion lens, the diversity lens into that. Obviously, we don't have capacity for 2021 to do that. Uh, but certainly, we should contemplate that for our future work programs. But in the meantime, uh, everything we're hearing today, we will try to uh, bring that in. Pat has done a really good job of bringing you a report that is manageable. Uh, like he said, he didn't want to bring 100 performance measures. It, this is, we will evolve this report and we'll certainly try to give you as much of that information that, uh, that all of you are asking for today. And I'm excited that, you know, members of commissioners uh, of the commission want to hear what's the performance measurement telling us and uh, how does that line up to what the customers feel about our service? So uh, that's, that's good. And I think that will be very, very important post COVID in terms of recovery, because if you went out and I asked most customers right now, top of the list is, is safety. And uh, safety is defined by different uh, uh, ways by different people in terms of, uh, is it COVID safety? Is it your personal safety? Uh, all those things. So um, we will do our best to give you everything that you're asking for today and not make it 100 performance measures uh, as, as Pat has uh, 
strongly encouraged us to be careful of. So uh, yes, Chair, we're fully aligned. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, Commissioner Wright. Uh, Gilbert, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to go back to something that Mr. Scrimger said in response to uh, Councillor Kavanaugh's questions and remarks. Mr. Scrimger, you made a distinction between, quote, the feeling of safety versus actual safety. Um, that remark is actually quite disturbing to me. I think it demonstrates the fundamental problem with our definition of safety. If our customers don't feel safe, they are not safe. If I, as a woman on our, our train or on our bus, don't feel safe, I'm not safe in my mind and in reality, I'm not safe. And to be honest with you, if I continuously don't feel safe using our transit system, if I have the option to not use it, I'm not going to use it. And so I'd like to give you the opportunity to clarify that remark because I found it incredibly disturbing. Well, as, as head of the, uh, the department, Commissioner, I will tell you that you're absolutely right. And I'll tell you why. I believe in everything you just said. And most importantly, uh, a few years ago, um, as some members know that we're on this commission, we had some serious concerns aligned to exactly what you're talking about, which Hollaback brought forward to us. And uh, to their credit, uh, we worked with them, we worked with Cowie, uh, we worked with uh, a bunch of groups in the community. And the statement was exactly what you said. You can tell me that your system is safe as you think it is, but if I don't, don't feel safe, I don't feel safe. And that's what led to the online reporting, the first in North America that actually won an award. Commissioner, we are fully aligned. You, if you don't feel safe, we can we could tell you how safe the system is. Uh, and Pat was not intending to do that. I'll, I'll give him an opportunity to, to speak, but I wanna tell you, we are not debating at all your comments about safety. If customers don't feel safe, we have a problem and we need to address that. And uh, so I'm very aligned to what you've just said. And I appreciate that, Mr. Mancone. If we have an award-winning award reporting system, which I know that we do, because Mr. Scrimger and I discussed it, and, and in previous comments said that the crime rate is something that we, we know we can produce and produce for these reports, we can also use our own data, i.e. that reporting system to report on being harassed, being, being, you know, feeling unsafe on our transit system. It provides context. It provides the context that groups like, and I won't speak for Hollaback, but I have, you know, I have had a couple of emails with them and I appreciate the work that they do. It's not just about the numbers, uh, the numbers of I broke my leg or I wasn't hanging on and I crashed in the front of the bus. I've done that. Um, you know, it's not about that. It's about feeling unsafe. It's about in yourself, not feeling as though you are physically or emotionally safe within the space that is a public service. And so I think that I'm not sure what the hesitancy is here to use our own data that is award-winning that we collect to report on in our metrics. But if the crime rate is something that we know we can produce and that's statistics you're getting from outside agencies, why can't we use our own data to report on harassment as well? And then, you know, contextualize it along with the sentiment reports or however we wanna call it. I just think that we're missing an opportunity here to, to really make some fundamental changes to our transit system or to prove that our transit system is absolutely getting better. You know, I, I just, I feel like we're missing a trick here and I think it's incredibly important to, you know, marginalize members of our communities, to, to women, um, and really apply the gender and equity inclusion lens to this report um, and not just, you know, um, report on, on criminal code statistics, which I am going to suggest when we see them are going to be very low. Those are, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Commissioner Wright Gilbert. Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, you want to go back on? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you to my colleague, uh, uh, member or council commissioner, pardon me, where am I? Commissioner Wright Gilbert. Um, uh, there are ways that we can do this, and there's and, and there's examples, and I appreciate talking about an award winning um, uh, system. Um, the UN Safe Cities report uh, would totally get this as well. There, there's ways we can get at this. And, and it's about building our ridership, it's about building confidence, and it's it's about equity. And I appreciate your comments, Mr. Mancone. Um, I, um, I think we can work on this together. 
um, there's still a ways to go. Obviously, there's a lot of recovery to, to come. Um, and there's a lot of hesitancy when people do get back into the system. But this is one that um, will linger. And I think that we need to address it. So I just wanted to say thanks for those, for that, uh, for what you said. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. So this report recommendations are that the Transit Commission receive the report for information and approve the inclusion of the two additional measures regarding customer safety as set out in this report for presentation in future reports. Are the report recommendations carried? Carried. Carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next up, we have the transit service evaluation criteria. We will have one speaker to uh, this or one delegation to this uh, item. But uh, first, if we could have the uh, staff presentation with the slides, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to ask Mr. Scrimger to uh, present this in a minute. I just uh, I want to make sure that we're all clear that staff is not recommending any service cuts here. This is the criteria should you choose and direct staff in the future to make service cuts. Um, and so now I'll turn it over to Mr. Scrimger. Thanks. I'll uh, wait for the slides to come up. So these are, uh, we'll start with a little bit of background and go into uh, what what is uh, uh, what is possible and then what, um, what our recommended criteria are for you. So as some background, this is just to bring onto one slide. Uh, things we've been talking about for a long time. <clears throat> we know that transit ridership declined dramatically uh, all of a sudden in March 2020 when the when the uh, pandemic hit Ottawa and the uh, lockdown began. People started working from home, people started learning at a distance, and uh, in order to preserve our operational capacity we uh, reduced transit ridership to about 50 percent then rising to 60 percent of normal levels. Ridership then uh, approximately doubled through the summer of 2020 as we had uh, new health measures brought in the transit system, as masks became compulsory across the transit system, and as we returned to full service. Ridership was then steady through the fall at about a third of what it would normally be because people continued to work from home, distance learning continued, and there were certainly public health measures to discourage travel. Next slide, please. Here's the graph of how ridership has changed during 2020 and the first part of 2021. The thick lighter blue line is the combined average of all ridership on the transit system. The dark blue line is the O-Train. So it's both O-Train lines up until May and then O-Train line one uh, since uh, line two closed. The, the gray line, the dark uh, gray line is conventional bus ridership, and the red line is paratransport ridership. And you can see that overall, they follow the same trend, uh, falling very low, uh, very quickly in March, rising gradually through to September, October, being fairly stable and steady from September to January, and then an immediate drop um, uh, with the lockdowns that came at Christmas time. However, you can also see that uh, ridership is higher on some parts of the system. Paratransport ridership is uh, at uh, um, 40 to 50 percent of where it would normally be back in December, uh, where ridership on the very downtown focused O-Train Line 1 has uh, rarely got above 20 percent of where it would normally be. The next slide, please. So uh, as we go into 2020, um, Ridership declined very quickly at the beginning and, and very likely has declined again uh, with the things that were announced in the last couple of weeks. Public health measures discouraged travel. Schools adopted remote learning, learning for a period, then went back to uh, on-site learning and now have gone back to remote learning. Ridership increased through February um, when the schools returned. Uh, January, we're at 18%. By the March, we were at 26%. Probably in April will be lower than that, but um, it goes up and down as the as the nature of the public health advice goes up and down, and we have to be ready for all possibilities in the future. The next slide, please. So one of the things that's um, 
uh, changed is who is riding transit. And the, the, you, you can look at this in more detail later, but the big lesson here, which is not a surprise to anybody, is the number of office workers which usually is one of our largest segments, has gone way down. You can see social science, education, government, and religion. These are, these are um, job categories that come from Statistics Canada, normally at 22% of our ridership. And you can see on the right that that's gone down. That's only 13% of our ridership. Students, the percentage has gone up, not because the number of students has gone up, but because um, sorry, it has gone down. We, we estimated at that time that um, that when we were doing this, about 25% of our uh, customers who were students were still making trips. So that had gone down from 21% of our total ridership to 16%. But some of those people who are in situations where they haven't had the choice, uh, you can see people uh, working in the service industry, you can see people who are unemployed, retired. Uh, those numbers have gone up as a percentage of our total ridership because they, they haven't had a choice. They need to continue to ride transit. They need to continue to travel even through these public health restrictions. The next slide, please. This is uh, a graph which I think we showed uh, another time before. This is uh, rail transit systems all across the world coming from the Comet benchmarking group that we're a member of. And you can see that across the world, the trends are generally similar different in nature, depending on the nature of how important transit is, how much transit is, and what, what, what are the, you know, what's the demographics and, and the work environment and the urban characteristics of that region. But all across the world, ridership went down at the, as the pandemic began. You can see it going down in the Asia Pacific region earlier, and then down in Europe, North America, and Latin America, all at the same time that it happened here. Um, Europe, North America, Latin America, all fell down to about the same uh, level of ridership and have all increased gradually, followed by um, more instability as you get to the end of 2020 and into 2021 as those second and third waves hit. Um, you can see Asia Pacific growing uh, and being higher and that's consistent over uh, all parts of that region. Um, Latin America being pretty similar to uh, North America, but with higher transit ridership overall and recovering a little bit better, but different between different uh, between countries. So that's just an overall to show that what we're experiencing in, in um, trend is not different from anyone else in the world. What's happening that's different in North America is that the recovery of transit ridership is lower. The next slide, please. So some of the things over the next two slides that uh, has happened to date, uh, decisions that have been taken by staff, the commission and council uh, in, in different, um, different ways. In March, 2020, bus service were reduced to about 50%. Um, immediate cost mitigations uh, were implemented with about a $13 million reduction in operating savings and about $20 million in capital spending that was deferred into future years to uh, start to address the city's financial situation. In June, the Transit Commission approved the recovery plan based on the public health guidelines. That was when um, masks came into use. There was a provincial three stage guidelines. There was a corporate recovery plan. The bus service went back to the full network. This was a, a big decision that was taken uh, in June 2020. In November 2020, we uh, staff provided the draft budget to council, which was ultimately approved. Uh, that included $30 million a year in cost reductions, up to $90 million in capital budget adjustments. And we also laid out for you the plans A, B, and C. What would we do if ridership did not come back uh, and whether or not other levels of government provided funding? And that, that budget was approved. On the next slide, carrying on into this year, we, we did, uh, the, you know, the city and especially the, the transit costs were uh, largely covered by contributions from the senior level of government with uh, $108.3 million coming in covering the last nine months of last year. Um, the small percentage, the, the 3.6 million that wasn't covered by that funding was for um, costs that we had incurred in March before the uh, provincial and federal fiscal year began. 
uh, this year in March 2021. Uh, we've uh, continued to see low ridership numbers. We're continuing to make savings. Uh, we've, uh, at our last, uh, the last meeting of the Transit Commission, we had advised you of the service adjustments that we were making to save about five and a half million dollars this year and $11 million in a full year if, if it's needed next year. And then at the April meeting today, we're presented to you the uh, criteria that we'd recommend you use if you're considering uh, cutting service, removing service from some parts of the network permanently. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a third of the way or a quarter, a third of the way into 2021, but we still don't know how 2021 will, uh, will end. Uh, we're further, probably further down this road right now than when these slides were drawn up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, vaccination has begun, begun with higher risk people increasing in volume delivered. We're seeing that it's starting to become more widespread. Uh, ridership return to the transit system is going to be determined by demand, influenced perhaps, but not determined by any actions that we take in managing the transit system. Uh, demand will depend largely on decisions that are made by major employers and major institutions and the largest for us are the federal public service, the universities and the colleges and the school boards. Uh, you know, as we drew this up, it, I would say it appears reasonable to think that there will be a gradually return to working on site through the fall, perhaps now that we're into our most recent couple of weeks, perhaps we're all a little less optimistic than we were about the timing of when that's going to happen. Um, some people may still choose to work at home. Some people may still be asked to work at home, depending on uh, the decisions that those employers make. And we, we should be ready for the universities and colleges to either decide to continue distance learning or to return to campus for the fall term. We probably need to cover both of those possibilities until the universities and colleges decide. Next slide, please. Federal and provincial funding for 2021, as I said, the city's actual needs will be determined by the actual transit ridership, which will be influenced by the rate at which people return. We don't know uh, how, when people will return. We don't know, therefore, how much money they will um, contribute through their fares. We do know what our costs will be. Um, working with our colleagues in finance, there's a, an end of year forecast that shows that we could use $153 million of federal funding and federal and provincial funding if the worst case comes true. Uh, the federal and provincial governments have, con have uh, confirmed that they're going to contribute up to $135 million. We've uh, identified our $5.5 million in savings. If that worst case comes true, there's a funding gap of $13 million. If the worst case isn't quite that bad, the gap would be less. At uh, the time we drew this up, we were awaiting the tabling of the federal government, the federal budget to confirm any additional assistance for municipalities. Um, that the, the, uh, it's not, uh, I don't know the budget well, but I understand that, uh, that that was not a subject of the budget. And as ridership, as I said, if ridership goes up, if, uh, if the city becomes healthier and people go back to work, um, we will get more fair revenue and that will lower that, that gap of $13 million. Next slide, please. So the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, what are what are service cuts? How would you evaluate? How would you consider them? And how, in the end, might you select them? Next slide, please. And as John mentioned, we're not recommending service cuts. What we're discussing is how how one might decide, what one might consider, what the commission and council would consider, should consider as they're determining whether service cuts are needed and what types of service cuts should be made. And when I talk about service cuts, I'm talking about a permanent loss of mobility, withdrawing a service from a time of day, a group of customers, uh, a region of the city, a district, um, so that there's no alternative. We've, been ma we've made service adjustments continuously, the kind of things that are uh, delegated to staff, uh, the authorities delegated to staff to make decisions on how frequently should a bus run, how should you, uh, how do we uh, correspond service to to ridership, uh, what kind of walking distances there are, and we've, you know, we told you last month about 
some temporary service reductions, suspending some routes temporarily where ridership was very, very low, uh, trimming some routes back where they ran parallel to other routes with higher ridership and uh, having some routes run less frequently than they would normally. But the service cuts that we describe in this document are the deeper things. These are really the permanent things, not, not a temporary suspension, but a permanent reduction. And some of those types of service cuts might be reducing frequency on a route with low ridership, for instance, running it every 30 minutes, uh, changing it from every 30 minutes to every 60 minutes, uh, permanently removing some of the connection routes, removing some local routes at certain times of the day, uh, perhaps evenings, weekends, um, the concept of removing some of the local routes entirely. And the uh, additional thing that we um, talked about in our in our um, business plan for this year, which is to look at the possibility of changing some local routes to on-demand service as um, other cities with lower ridership than we have are considering right now. An overall comment uh, is that um, we are certain at this point, and we can advise you that there are no options out there to bring efficiencies to the network, to restructure the network, to be more efficient while still maintaining the same quality of service. At this point, any service cut that would be made has a measurable negative effect on transit customers in some way. Next slide, please. So when we assess the impact that a service cut would have on customers, we measure, we can measure it in a number of ways. Customers experience on the transit system is measured by how long it takes to walk to the nearest stop or station, how long you have to wait when you're there for the next bus or train, how long your travel time is on board, how many transfers you have to make to complete your trip and how reliable that service is. And, uh, you know, Closer walking distance, shorter waiting time, shorter travel time, fewer transfers, more reliability are all positive things that would make a customer's experience better and the opposite would make their customer's experience worse. And we can count the number of customers who will be affected by these kinds of changes. And we can, from that code, those counts and the degree of change, we can estimate how much ridership would decline from these reductions in service quality. And then we can compare those negative effects and the the change in transit ridership with the cost savings that would be achieved and we can rank potential cuts in order we can say these will lose you this many customers per dollar uh, and say that some are less impactful than others but that doesn't tell the complete story because not everyone has a choice so next slide please the equity and inclusion lens guides us because it uh, this is a, you know, a, a fundamental policy decision of council that any potential decision being made by council be evaluated for it, its effects on groups of people who are already disadvantaged. And the equity and inclusion lens identifies the groups as listed on this page, indigenous people, francophone people, LGBTQ people, immigrants, new Canadians, older adults, people living in poverty, people who have disabilities, racialized people, rural residents, women, youth, and generally speaking, others who are also at risk of being excluded from decisions or consideration. And one of the aspects of OC Transpo is when you take all of these groups together, they represent the majority of our customers. Next slide, please. So normally, when we'd give you any staff recommendation on a major service change, that would come along with an assessment of its effects on these groups. If there's a negative impact on an area of the city, we would check to see if that's an area of the city which is um, uh, where travel is being made by uh, out of proportion by one or more of those um, groups so that you'd be able to consider that. If we're looking across the whole system, if there were ever a decision to be taken to direct staff to look at multi-million dollar service cuts, we can be certain that all of these groups will be negatively affected. We can calculate the degree to which they're affected. Uh, but one of the considerations we'll, we'll we'd come back to you with at the time is how precise should that um, evaluation be across the equity and inclusion lens? If it's... Um, 
if it's particular root by root by root, then it's, it's a bigger piece of work and will take time to do, could delay the time by which council can make its decisions. Um, if it's a, a broad based description, just so the council knows uh, the impacts of the decision it's considering, that is something that um, could be done more quickly. The next slide, please. The question is, how do you decide? You know, we, we don't know how we'd, uh, you know, we don't speak here about how you decide the degree of savings that would be needed, but how do you select? Then the least harmful impact, the least harmful result in the short term is to select the service cuts that achieve the greatest savings with the least negative effect on customers. Generally speaking, that would be, that would mean removing routes where there are nearby alternatives. The definition of nearby will change depending on the, the quantum of what kind of savings are required and removing routes and time periods where there are fewer customers. The greatest savings on the other hand come from cuts during peak periods because they drive some of our fixed costs as well as our variable costs. But when we reduce service during peak periods, we end up reducing the city's long-term ability to grow. If we uh, retire buses from the fleet, it's a, it's a multi-year process to budget, procure, and get those buses back into the fleet. If the transit workforce is made smaller, it is a matter of months to uh, recruit, train, and, and bring new staff um, onto the system. So as I mentioned earlier, we could give a list that's developed, we can develop a list, put it in ranked order from least harmful, to most harmful, add up those savings and draw a cutoff at the point that achieves the level of savings that council is looking for. But whatever those decisions are, everyone involved in those decisions needs to consider that the result of that is a longer walk for customers, a longer wait for customers, perhaps more crowding, all of which will discourage transit use for those who have a choice. And for those who don't have a choice, who are limited to using transit and don't have other alternatives available to them, either for reasons of their uh, disability or reasons of their economic situation, those people have to endure that longer walk, that longer wait, or that crowding because they don't have an alternative other than using transit. Next slide, please. Consultation can be a major important part of any municipal decision. Um, in the case, if, if the commission, if the council were considering service cuts, uh, consultation would allow for inf information to be shared with customers and residents about the reasons for the cuts, the details of the potential cuts. It would be an opportunity for customers to explain their travel needs uh, and to tell the story of how they, what the negative impacts are for them would allow those uh, involved in making the decision to understand the particular ways that those potential service cuts would affect customers. Consultation right now during the pandemic is best carried out online, which is quite different from uh, way, the way it's been in the past. If consultation were done along these lines, we'd provide those in the, the staff, we would tally up the information, find a way of capturing the, the things that people are saying and let them comment on octransport.com and support any additional consultation methods that councillors would choose to carry out. Next slide, please. We'd then summarize the results of the consultation, uh, work with councillors to uh, revise the list of potential service cuts to address points that were raised, and in the end, um, bring a, a set of recommendations to, to, uh, to the commission. So that's the end of the presentation. There's much more in the report, and I hope uh, you've, you've read through the report. It, it um, describes um, these points uh, that it's to be, you know, we, we would, if we were to do broad service cuts, deep service cuts, we need to have direction from the commission on how we are to decide, how we are to bring recommendations to you, and um, how we are to consider the the many uh, contradictory aspects of um, of this and how uh, how it how it can affect both people in the short term, different groups of people in the short term, 
but also uh, how it can affect the city's stated and approved ambitions and policy directions for the future of being a, um, a more uh, a more inclusive, a more transit dependent um, urbanized city than it has been. So um, I'll turn it back to John, if uh, John has any more comments um, beyond what I've just laid out. No, it's uh, back to the chair. Thanks, Pat. Okay, thank you uh, both. Thank you, Pat, for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, first up with the questions is Commissioner Caracato, please. Just a reminder, Chair, um, there's a member of the public uh, registered oh. to speak. Thank you, Eric. Sorry, I just noticed that again, uh, too. Uh, sorry, Commissioner Caracato, if uh, you could just hold on. We have one uh, delegation. Uh, my apologies, uh, Salma al uh If you're available, would you? Um, my apologies for skipping over there. If uh, you want to start whenever you're ready. No worries. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the engagement we've had over the past uh, three weeks uh, about this issue. Um, I, I know I understand that uh, we're not recommending any service cuts at this point. Uh, however, I would like to address the long-term and short-term service cuts. Um, and first, I'm going to start with the long-term cuts, uh, if it's ever considered by council. Um, there is just so much juice that you can squeeze out of a lemon. And staff clearly stated in their report that there are no remaining options to restructure the network to be more efficient while still maintaining the same access to mobility and the same quality of service. Any service cut will have negative effect on customers who use the service that is uh, affected and the negative impact will be disproportionately felt by the people who, know, who have no other option but to use transit. On page 12 of the report, it was stated that it is essential if the city's long-term goals are to be achieved to preserve the ability for the transit system to return to full operations. The greatest cost savings require substantial and lasting cuts, such as by laying off staff, retiring buses from fleet and uh, disposing of them, or by closing and disposing of facilities such as stations and bus garages. If any of uh, these decisions are made, they're irrevocable and it will be expensive and slow to rebuild our pre-pandemic service level. Um, staff gave examples and um, for, for example, they said, if staff levels are reduced, future growth will require recruitment, selection and training of new staff, which will take months to complete after funding is made available. And another example, if the size of bus fleet is reduced, further growth will require buying buses and a process that can take up to two years from the time the capital funding is approved by council. So how much could we potentially save by losing our fleet? And if we were to repurchase it, how much will it cost? While the service cuts are to minimize cost in the short term, considering the long-term impact and significant cost to reinstate the service, would it be wise to do these steps? Reducing services would reduce mobility for customers who now use the service to travel from uh, to and from the areas affected. And um, it was also mentioned in the report that it could actually have significant harm, such as remove the ability of some people to hold a job. Provincial Policy Statement 2020 clearly states that long-term prosperity, human and environmental health and social well-being should take precedence over short-term considerations and that it is in the interest of all communities to use land and resources wisely. While ridership is low, maintaining the service is important as transit will be the guide for any new future development. It, will be, um, it was mentioned during one of the OP presentations that um, it's important to have the transit infrastructure prior to development completion so that people um, can actually em embrace the transit system once they settle. Because if people move to alternate transportations, then they may not take transit once it is provided. Considering the above and considering the first step in any service cut according to this report is to have council directing staff to the level of cuts and savings required, I would like to point out that any service cut will not be in line with provincial policy statement 2020, nor with council priorities 
and goals listed in the report. And therefore, I ask you that we should not be uh, seeking any service cuts by council to begin with. We should draw a red line here. Otherwise, we must rethink our official plan and transportation master plan and uh, the directions we wanna go from there. Um, there, there is uh, one also, minute left. There is also one thing I'm going to uh, mention with regards to the uh, temporary adjustments. In the report, the staff mentioned that uh, they can estimate the number of customers who would stop using OC transport system entirely if the service cuts were made. I'd like to ask if staff can inform the commission about the number of customers who would do so given the temporary suspensions uh, that were planned for June and uh, how much revenues will that permanently uh, make the city lose uh, as a result. Uh, additionally, considering the time required for recruitment as explained earlier and quoted in this report, uh, the proposed 70 staff cuts and the fact that we're aiming to extend O-Train South in 2022, um, would it be possible in budget 22 uh, not to have the cuts uh, in order to allow OC Transport to have a uh, hiring uh, ability if that arises and any surplus then be reinstated eventually to the city if it That's happens. time. Thank hey, you. Thank you very much, Salma, for your presentation. Uh, I won't ask the, the four members to drop their hands because I believe you all had questions for staff. Could somebody just wave in their screen if they had any questions for the delegation? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you very much for coming out today and thank you for your correspondence to the commission as well. We appreciate your, your input. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, so uh, first up I have uh, Commissioner Caracato followed by uh, Commissioner Brock, or, uh, yeah, Commissioner Brockington. You're on thank mute. You. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you to that delegation. That was an excellent presentation. Um, really, really good thoughts in there. Um, I appreciate the plan um, that we're seeing today. Um, I think it's it's good that we have something on the table should we have to go here. And I also appreciate that likely none of us around the table here or on the call want to be going there. Um, so in that light, um, maybe I'll just take a step back and see if there are other capital budget adjustments, um, such as the ones we we came up with pretty quickly last March, um, that were considered or that we could consider before looking at service cuts. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, absolutely, you recall the the Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C, uh, and the good the good news here is Plan A has come together quite nicely. You'll recall the treasurer gave you an update at the FEDCO meeting and council. Uh, so the gap is around $13 million, which, which sounds like a lot. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the scale of the, the operation we run, uh, it's very manageable. And uh, what, uh, what I have spoken to the treasurer and the city manager is, is that we're going to see this month by month. And if we need to, we go to plan B, which was some further reduction in capital which would be capital deferrals uh, before we, uh, we go to plan C. And plan C is the, is the doomsday scenario where you start making severe cuts. Um, so um, we would tweak our capital uh, and uh, a mix of deferrals and, and some, some adjustments. And then also through WIPs, which we normally do. So we'd mine out the capital areas before we go into uh, even starting to think about plan C. And then also for 2022, you're positioned with uh, the annualized savings that you just approved, which is $11 million. So we've looked ahead to 2022, which you've heard the mayor and the chair talk about in terms of look ahead. So we we're proactive with the measures that you approved at the last meeting. Okay, that's good. So just to be clear, there are more capital budget adjustments that could be done in plan B before we move to doomsday C. We, we absolutely plan for that, and that's exactly what we would do, yes. Great. And, and keep the expenditure control measures in place, which you recall I mined out, I think, around $12 million last year. So we're going to do that before we get into capital adjustments. Okay, great. So sounds like we have more options. Um, 
Are we also doing a similar exercise to determine where we can grow revenue to avoid any service cuts or capital adjustments? Uh, absolutely, uh, but it's, it's slim offerings. You did the advertising motion that you approved commissioner uh, or that you recommended. Uh, we're looking at what universities are going to do uh, 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 regarding the U-Pass. Um, festivals, unfortunately, aren't happening. Um, I don't know if there's been an announcement on the Red Blacks. Uh, we're looking, you know, Blues Fest is deferred. That was a revenue source for us. Um, we need COVID to come to an end and uh, we can start uh, mining out all, all this stuff. But uh, everything's on the table. The, the thrust is uh, deliver good, safe, reliable service at the lowest unit cost and save as much as we can uh, so that we have those efficiencies and that before we get into capital reductions. Okay, if I may, I, and I don't know if I'm allowed to do a direction to staff, but could we come up with a list of perhaps some revenue options that are on the table, um, such as the ones you've mentioned, but also others that we could then discuss as a commission? I'm happy to send uh, to the commission members uh, all of our revenue inputs that we get. And if there's ideas that you may have, uh, I wouldn't wait for a meeting. Send them to me is, is my advice. If you've got, I'll take any revenue I can get right now. Yeah, okay. I think a, a good conversation about those ideas um, would be helpful. Um, but if I have any, I'll definitely send them along by email. Um, on to... Uh, page four of the report, the steps that uh, we would need to follow if council determined to proceed with service cuts. Just trying to get a sense of how long that process would take. The most difficult thing you would need to contemplate as uh, members of commission and council is how long you want to consult. And, uh, it could, it, and you know, I would caution you if you don't consult and you, you cut service, uh, you'll have a major backlash. Um, and uh, to consult, you need to, to do it properly. Uh, you need to give time. Uh, I can tell you that the last time there was a major service adjustments was route optimization, and that went on for an extended period of time. There was a lot of public meetings uh, and a lot of discussion and debates and uh, um, adjustments that needed to be done through that process. So it's it's not it's months, it's not weeks. But again, we're, we would be in your hands as to if you wanted to move at an accelerated pace and just do you know, email consultation rather than uh, facilitated consultation, we would move quickly. I doubt that's what you'd want to do and it would not be our recommendation. Okay, great. No, I would not suggest we short change the consultation by any means. I was just trying to get a sense of how many months or, you know, weeks or years this would take. Um, and then to put it in perspective, Commissioner, if there was a decision to proceed now, you'd be into assuming a normal consultation process of the scope and scale of tens of millions of dollars of service cuts, you'd be into mid 2022 for implementation this point if you started today okay so about a year um that i just want to say that uh i was really glad to see no proposed cuts at all to para transpo i think uh, we've come a long way and uh i would i would totally so vote against any cuts to para at this point so thank you and i'll conclude with that Hey, thank you, uh, Commissioner Caracato. And uh, I think one lesson that we've all learned in COVID is don't make predictions about how fast something's going to change. Uh, Commissioner uh, Brockington, you're up next. Thanks, Chair. Um, three weeks ago at our special meeting, I asked Mr. Manconi about our financial situation, and he wasn't exactly sure about the numbers. So I'm, I'm, pleasantly surprised, but surprised about how good the financial situation appears to be. About five to six months ago, we were predicting a very dire financial situation for OC Transfo as of April 1st. As of April 1st, the bailouts that the province and feds were giving us were to expire. And the whole reason we created options A, B, and C were because we needed a plan to get through 2021. So I've just heard 135.3 million. Like, where did this money come from? 
when when was this big? I, I don't know if I've just been busy with vaccine rollout in my ward, but when were the big announcements that there was new money after April 1st? So the treasurer provided that to all members of council at the, uh, the last FEDCO meeting, and she stepped you through all of that. And uh, the uh, slide 10 summarizes all that, which gets to that $13 million uh, uh, gap that we've got right now. And thanks to provincial and federal uh, funding, it, uh, it all came through. So I, I'm not on FEDCO, so just elaborate for the commission, please. Yeah. Um, what are the details of the money? Uh, so let's go to slide 10, please, Eric. I don't know if the treasurer or the deputy treasurer is on. Uh, Eric, do you know if they're here? Wendy or uh, Isabel is on the call. I will step through this if, even if they're not here. Uh, I'm not seeing them on. Okay. So there you have it there, Councillor Brockington. Um, and the federal and the provincial funding confirmed 135. And uh, we then you approved the five and a half million dollar savings. So your gap is about 13.2. We were at that time awaiting the federal budget to confirm if there was anything else. And the answer is no. Uh, and um, and so we're left with what happens with ridership and that, that $13 million gap. So we go to plan B and we continue with our, um, our actions that we took last year, which um, the, uh, there was operational savings, uh, $12.8 million in operating savings is what we mined out last year with freezes and, and fuel savings and, and things like that. Well, you know, not to discount 13.2 million, that's a big number, uh, but this is doable as, as OC Transpo and City of Ottawa, this is a number that we can tackle. So I'm, I'm relieved that um, some options we were considering at budget time last year, uh, doesn't seem to be as uh, significant or as dire. So I'm, I'm happy in that regard that service will be able to, to be maintained. Um, Mr. Manconi, a common question I have is who from the city is talking to the Public Service Commission, the four post-secondary institutions? Are we getting a sense that once public servants have been vaccinated, that there's gonna be a push to return to work? What are we hearing? Okay. Uh, Eric, can you, you can take that slide down, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor, I followed up with the city manager when you raised that at our last meeting. He has spoken to uh, senior level uh, government officials there. We have a meeting that's coming up. They're gonna be meeting with myself, Mr. Kanalakis and Mr. Willis uh, for the federal government employees. And then we're also uh, teeing up a meeting with the universities because those are the two tranches that are really still, there is no firm uh, response yet from the federal government or the universities. Uh, but I can assure you uh, it's a, bi-weekly discussion for me, because that's uh, that's what I need to know. I, I think we can make a case, Chair, that we are disproportionately impacted more than other cities whose workforces are more diverse than in the capital city of Canada, where such a large um, portion of our, our workers are with the federal government. They're not our only riders, but they occupy a, a significant chunk and I think we can make a case to the feds that if you are going to make a decision not to go back to work, you have to understand this impacts public transit in Ottawa. So I think we can make a strong case for additional operating funds from the feds that you make a choice, it impacts us. Otherwise, we, we scramble with the financial situation that we're in now. So I appreciate those conversations are ongoing, but um, I really do think Ottawa, city of Ottawa is impacted at a greater rate than other cities like Toronto, whose economy is much more diverse than ours. And um, their transit ridership is consequently much higher than ours is at the time. So thanks, Chair. Hey, thank you, Councillor. Uh, next up is uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert, please, followed by Councillor McKenney. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, 
so the message I'm getting from this from this report is that there are no there's no good option, right? That that cutting service it's not really a good option. That that raising fares that is definitely not a good option, and I agree with that. Raising taxes isn't a good option, um, and so essentially we are being asked to approve criteria for us to make um, for us and for council essentially to make a decision of which there are no good options. Would that be a, a fair way to sum that up? I wouldn't characterize it that way. Um, okay. This commission asked for Mr. Manconi, before you do cuts, what are you going to do? How are you gonna do it? And we committed to bringing you back this report in terms of the criteria. Uh, and um, in, in addition to that, you advised uh, what do, what can you do before you, you know, the plan A, plan B and plan C scenario. So we've got the plan A uh, mapped out, thanks to the work that we did uh, at the political level and at the staff level. And we have the plan B uh, scenario. And this is the last uh, tranche of that. And in addition to that, we proactively found the five and a half million dollar service adjustments uh, with a full annualization of $11 million. Okay, but you'll so agree we're, with we're me. I'm giving you what you asked for. for. No, for sure, absolutely. And I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you there at all. But what I'm saying is, is that the options of cutting service is not something that anybody wants to do. I think we can agree with that, agree on that. And raising fares, I don't think anyone anyone wants to do that either. And, and raising taxes, definitely no one wants to do that when we have an election year coming up. So that was, that was my point is that we've got some options, sorry, we've got some options before us in terms of how we would proceed in this plan that are not optimal options and that it's going to be a hard decision. That was that was the statement I was making. Okay. Um, so my, my colleagues have touched on sort of uh, the money situation and I will leave that to their expertise. What really what really sort of um, struck me in this uh, in this report um, yeah. is that there is a focus on um, on consultation. And as you know, that's what I do for a living. So it, uh, it struck me and it stuck out to me. Um, I agree that there needs to be a lot of consultation on this. We need to make sure that if we are going to make massive decisions that are going to impact our transit service, not just for one year, but for years to come, I would, I would suggest that we are consulting with the people that these decisions are going to impact. So along that line of thought, um, I do note that because of, you know, the, the pandemic situation, the suggestion is that, that consultations will be carried out online primarily. I don't disagree with that. But just something to keep in mind is that we do have, uh, you know, people within our, within our city, uh, quite a few people, I would suggest, that these changes are going to impact them very heavily. These are people who perhaps work multiple jobs and take public transit to get to those jobs because they can't afford a car or can't drive. Um, these people are also a lot of them don't have access, regular access to internet. They perhaps were accessing it, the internet uh, at libraries and of course they can't do that now. So I wanna make sure that when we're talking about consultation, we're talking about accessible consultations, not just fill out a, you know, give us your thoughts by email or give us your thoughts on this online service. We do need to be having some sort of uh, way for, for impacted customers, for all customers to provide their feedback um, on any proposed changes in a way that is accessible to them. Um, otherwise, we are, we are um, cutting out a proportion of our customer base that just won't have a way to, to engage with us on those. So while I understand we can't do like a town hall style meeting um, just yet, you never know, we may get there. Um, you know, I just think it's important to consider that um, not everyone has a computer, not everyone has data on their phone, not everyone has access to the internet or can afford it. And we need to make sure that those people who I was just are gonna be impacted most heavily um, by any cuts to service are also included in our, um, in our consultations. Those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, next up is uh, Councillor McKenney, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so a few questions. I noted that um, in the report under equity and inclusion and, and uh, Pat Scrimger, you mentioned it as well, that when, you, when we look at the, the groups 
uh, that the lens uh, encompasses uh, taken together that they represent the majority of OC Transpo customers. I take it you meant that that was prior to uh, COVID, um, but would you agree that today they probably make up, if not all, virtually all of our uh, ridership? I think that uh, more for sure. Um, I think there will still be some, there are still a significant number of people who are traveling on the transit system now who are not covered by those, but they're going to be a minority. There's, you know, the people who are still traveling are the essential workers who are male and are getting a good wage. Those would be a minority of our current transit customers, but they would be the ones who aren't identified as a group in the equity and inclusion lens. Yeah, sure. And, and I, I can understand that and, and, and picture who that is, it, you know, if you look at slide five, but, but really, I think we do have to recognize that the groups that fall under our equity inclusion lens make up a much larger proportion today than, than previous. Uh, yeah. And, and that is bolstered by that table that's on, on page Five. Eight, I, is it slide five? I actually wanted to go to, sorry, I actually wanted to go to slide five, if you don't mind, because I just have a, a question, I something I don't understand about the numbers. Yeah. Eric, can you bring up slide five? It's uh, who is riding transit these days? Oh, excellent. Okay. So, um, So can I I'll try yeah. try a couple yeah. of Yeah, if you could so. just yeah explain the you know what under estimated current customer demographics the estimated percentage making trips. What does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the estimated percentage of current ridership? Okay, so uh, I'll, let me start with an example. Uh, uh, if you look at the left column, let's to go with unemployed people who are unemployed are normally two percent of our ridership, and we collect that data. Um, through uh, Statistics Canada and through our, our origin destination survey. Okay. Go across to the right-hand side. Those unemployed people are probably, at the time we drew this up, which was pre, uh, it, was, it was last fall, so it's pre the deeper lockdown we're in right now. Our estimate is that those people are still making those trips. 100% of those trips are still being made. They have no alternatives. They have to make those trips. The trips they had to make before are still what they have to do now. So there's one example. Another example, um, look the top of the left list, social science, education, government, and religion. That's just the grouping that Statistics Canada gives it, but because it's got people working in education, people working in government, that that's the biggest group of our customers at 22% of our normal ridership. Our estimate based on some surveys that uh, our colleagues in economic development did and discussions that they were having with um, a wide range of stakeholders was that about 20% of those trips are now being made. So over on the right hand side, we estimate that 20% of the trips that are being made by that group are now being made. So as you look down that column that says estimated percent making trips, our yeah. the estimates okay. we're working from 25% of the students are, are still traveling. 50% of the people who work in sales and service are still traveling, 20%, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then when we add all those up, we do the math, add them up. How does that, how does that change the distribution of these people of our current ridership, our last fall ridership, where normally our students would be Normally, students would be 21% of our ridership. Right now, we believe that they're about 16% of our much lower ridership. Uh, social science, education, government, religion, normally 22%. We think it's now about 13% of our normal. So you can see there, for instance, health workers, normally 2% of our ridership, we think is now 5% of our ridership. Okay. That's what this number means. And the result of it is ex exactly what you're saying. It's that the people who are, well, two, two things. It's the people who are identified 
by the equity and inclusion lens as being disadvantaged now make up a greater fraction of our total ridership than they would have pre-pandemic, but also, and more, more narrowly, the people who don't have a choice who must use transit are making up a greater proportion of the total. When our ridership fell last year to 15%, and when it reached January, 18% of what it would normally be, it is likely that almost all of the people who were traveling on transit at that time were doing so because they had to make the trip and they had to use transit. This wasn't a choice of whether to make a trip. This wasn't a choice of how to make that trip. And that may represent, that may be some uh, indication of what proportion of our total ridership is in that kind of a situation. Okay, that, that, that is helpful. Uh, to, just to establish for us really in, in stark numbers who is still on transit, who still needs to be uh, on transit. And uh, for the most part, um, they are essential trips made by essential workers. Um, sometimes people who are unemployed as well, having to get to maybe part-time jobs or contracts or looking for work. But for the most part, people left on our transit system fall under our equity and inclusion lens under the groups that we've identified and they are uh, essential workers that we are trying to protect um, um, today. So, so I appreciate the, 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 the more detail into that. Um, another question was around, um, you know, vulnerable parts of the population as, uh, as criteria. Uh, just, I'm just not sure how um, you know, you talk about not wanting to have a disproportionate impact um, on vulnerable parts of the population, but I'm not sure how you um, assess that. I'll give you an example, a quick example in, in the ward I represent. Um, we're, a, we're, a, we're recognized as one of the uh, neighborhoods um, in the uh, neighborhood study that is uh, a high risk neighborhood, but essentially it's because we have so many rooming houses. Uh, you take the rooming houses out and today we probably wouldn't fall into that category. So I just, I'm, I'm curious and, and concerned about how you would identify uh, vulnerable populations. What we can do is those, those data are available to us geographically to some degree. So we know geographically where seniors live. We know geographically where um, many of the groups that are identified um, in the equity inclusion lens live in greater or, or lower proportion across the city. Um, and when we're considering, when we're evaluating for you a potential service reduction or potential service cut in a particular part of the city, we could look at the zones along that route and say, along this route, people with disabilities make up a greater fraction than average or a lower fraction than average, and therefore are, are more affected. Seniors are more or less affected because there are more of them in that area. Um, my suggestion is that some of the uh, people who identified in the equity and inclusion, some of the groups that are identified in the equity, equity and inclusion lens um, are disadvantaged in ways that don't relate so strictly to transportation. Um, for instance, francophones are, are disadvantaged in other ways. Um, uh, LGBTQ people are probably disadvantaged in other ways more than related to transportation but youth, people with disability, women, people with low income, uh, people who are newly arrived in, in Ottawa are all uh, going to be affected by transportation and they're the ones that, um, that we would look at. Now it's not necessarily the same people, but it's probably very close to the same people who are affected more deeply by uh, COVID and by the public health restrictions that come out of COVID the people who are asked to work at home are very likely to be 
upper income people, the people who still need to make trips for medical reasons, maybe um, still seniors and people with disabilities. Um, you know, not that any of these is 100% match, but those trends may occur and and the, you know, the people who are most affected by COVID and therefore must still travel, the people who are, well, let, let me explain that better. The people who must still travel in the transit system right now, the people who are identified by the equity and inclusion lens and the people who don't have any choice but to use transit, there may be a lot of overlap between these, these very broad definitions of people. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um... I think that when we're looking at this, I have, I mean, I'm certainly not able to support um, approving a, an evaluation criteria unless, I, I mean, nobody wants to see um, service cuts. But this, what, what, what we have in front of us today, what I'm seeing in front of us today is, you know, let's look at best way to, greatest savings that impact the people who need our services the most, the people who are most disadvantaged. And nowhere am I seeing a suggestion that we look at our fair funding model. Nowhere am I seeing a suggestion that perhaps the rest of us who aren't impacted by COVID, who haven't been uh, disproportionately affected by COVID, who aren't living in poverty all the time, uh, who aren't uh, part of uh, uh, our marginalized groups. Um, we're looking to them for, for further savings. We're looking to them to pick up, the, to pick up um, service cuts. We're looking to them to not have, you know, I mean, at some point going from 30 to 60 minutes means not having a route. Um, so, you know, unless we see as a council um, at least put in front of us what a change to that fair funding model would look like so that, you know, the rest of us could pick up that slack. What does that mean? Does that mean that I, as a homeowner, as a, as a taxpayer, might have to pay an extra, you know, $8 a, a, a year to, to keep transit where it is and not disadvantage people who are already so greatly disadvantaged? Um, unless I can see that, unless we have that conversation uh, as a council, making these decisions for people who aren't around the table and, you know, we can go out and we can consult, but, you know, we've done that before and still the, the outcomes, um, you know, affect people who, who aren't at those tables all the time. So uh, until we see that, I would, I would suggest that, that we not approve uh, evaluation criteria um, that we see in this report because it, it's not balanced. It's not, and, it, and I'm not even looking for a balance. I, I think that the time has come to put balance aside. And for those of us that can afford it, and for those of us that are, are fortunate enough that we have not been so affected by COVID, so affected by a downturn in the economy, so affected by uh, changes to transit, that perhaps it's time for us to um, pick up uh, that for the people that uh, are essential workers that are going to work every single day and, and have to take uh, our transit. Uh, so chair, I will be asking for yeas and nays and I won't, uh, I won't be able to uh, support the report recommendations as is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, uh, Mr. Manconi, maybe you can uh, clarify something for me um, following the comments uh, just received from the, the councillor. How much money would we be looking at shifting to the tax base if mid-year we were to switch to a, a, a totally free transit system? Uh, what's the total budget amount that would be switched over to the tax base? And sorry, Chair, I wasn't asking for totally free at this point although I would take it. Uh, what I'm asking is what would it take for us to pick up the slack to make up the difference in what we would be looking for in, in service oh. cuts? Just okay, thank you. Okay. I thought you were talking about a, a, a 
pre-model. Uh, then cancel that uh, request, Mr. Manconi. Uh, did you have any comments uh, on this then before we move on to uh, Commissioner Olson? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I just want to reiterate, um, we are not recommending any service cuts. Uh, we're just bringing back what council directed us to bring back during the budget, which was part of the plan A, B, and C. And remember, all of you asked, or many of you asked, what is the criteria and process? And so we're just doing what uh, what council has asked for. And absolutely, we are not recommending any service cuts. And uh, you'll recall during the budget deliberations, I, I mentioned the studies that showed all the other jurisdictions that did the knee-jerk reaction and did service cuts, they hurt those that needed it the most. With respect to who pays for transit and fare box recovery and everything, that's all part of your long range financial plan. And uh, the affordability plan is where that discussion uh, fits in on that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Manconi. Uh, Commissioner Olson, uh, you're up next, followed by uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Scrimger, I just wanna to go to slide 16, where you talk about the, uh, the how to decide and you talk about the least harmful result is to select service cuts that achieve the greatest savings with the least impact here is coming up. Talk about where it would, be, would mean removing routes where there are nearby alternatives and removing routes in time periods with fewer customers. If there are routes with nearby alternatives, that means there are two routes that could potentially be considered for, for cutting, I would, I would think. That's how I read it. But also you could see instances arising where you had a route that had nearby alternatives, but was very busy. You could also find a route that there, there may be no uh, nearby alternatives, but there's, a, there's a, a lot of customers. And I just wonder with respect to this, there's obviously, obviously the impact is going to have to be considered as well. This doesn't get into that on the, on the, the, uh, the different lenses that we're addressing. So I just wonder if there's scope to think about this and refine it as we sort of go forward. The way we, so two, two things, um, maybe three. When, I, when we say here nearby, this would mean nearby, but not to our current standards. We have standards right now set by the council and commission or as council before the commission was uh, formed uh, that tell us what is a reasonable walking distance to the nearest bus route. That's, uh, you know, 400 meters during rush hours, 800 meters or a 10 minute walk at other times of the day. That number could, would have to be stretched if we were to, um, to remove some routes to save some, some money. There would be, it would be a reduction of the service quality standards that the commission has met. There are no routes right now, which are in excess of the standards that are set. There are, we run a basic geographic coverage and we supplement that according to, uh, to the need for capacity. Sometimes when we add capacity, we can space the routes more frequently, more closely together rather than uh, just beefing up service with a long walk. And that's how we get the, the service we have. The second is when you, you talk about how do we scale these, how do we measure these things? Well, that's what we lay out back on, on slide 13, that we measure customers' experience by the walk, the weight, the travel time, the number of transfers, and the reliability, and multiply that by the number of customers who are experiencing that change. So one of the ways we can do that, and one of the ways we normally do that is to turn everything into person minutes. How many person minutes of delay have we added? Just turn off this ringing phone. Um, how many person minutes of added travel time, added customer time, and then divide that by the number of customers over whom that effect is spread. And that's how we can uh, make a comparison of the total impact on customers. Now, if we break it down into demographic groups, we have to break that down into uh, the effect on people who have a choice and the effect on people who don't have a choice of how they're going to make their trip. Okay, Mr. Scrimgeour, thank you. I appreciate your answer. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so next up is Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, these are, um, it's very sobering information and, um, and it's something that we do have to look at. 
Um, one of the questions I have is, do we, do we have um, information in terms of um, on uh, in, ter in terms of our ridership amount? In ter um, is that available? We have ridership numbers in very great detail. We know the number of people who are getting on and off each trip at each stop across the whole system. And that builds up to the, the number that we've reported to you into the pre, in the previous presentation of our total ridership. I, I asked about gender. Oh, I'm we sorry. Know? I, we, we, know about, we know about gender on an overall number. We don't know as much about the, we know, we know how much of our total ridership from the origin destination survey is women versus men versus uh, people who identify differently. And in fact, we may not have that because our surveys are a bit too old. Um, we know geographically a little bit, but route by route by route, trip by trip, customer by customer, we don't know at that detail. So we apply overall, um, overall figures. We do know that generally speaking, women make up more than half of the ridership on all transit systems. Okay. And do we know um, during the pandemic if uh, the numbers changed or if it's the same or increased? Um, I don't know whether we know that. Okay. I think that would be uh, for, very interesting to know in terms of, uh, in terms of essential workers and, and uh, who's going out there, um, if that is possible. Um, some some great points have been raised and i guess the elephant in the room is is uh, is the fact that we rely on transit fare and um and we have to look at you know if we've already established in the last year um just by our actions that these this is an essential service there's no question about it we we call this an essential service and um it needs our support and we even passed a motion asking the federal government to support to help us uh, support in our operation unfortunately it fell on deaf ears but i think the point was is that um we need to make sure the system is in place and i um but you know efficiencies will have to be made along the line doesn't mean that we're not we're going to keep everything exactly the same if things aren't being used we shouldn't worry about it i i would appreciate the information that councillor mckinney was asking for in in terms of uh uh, of what it, of the costs of of what the, uh, of our current situation and and what it would mean, um, because um, I I think it's very very important as a city um, going forward our official plan etc. We need to keep the system in place. We don't I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know when things are going to recover or what recovery will, will look like, but I think that we we should at least know what it would take. So um, I would support. Um, at least looking at these things, because um, I think we've already, by our actions, uh, supported the idea that we have to keep a full system in place for, for those who need it. And um, so uh, notwithstanding all the possible things, um, adjustments are, always have to be made. This is, this is a live beast, as it were, that um, constantly has to have adjustments made to it. And um, I... I, I fully expect that. So I just wanted to say I support that. I don't know if you have any comments uh, regarding that. Doesn't sound like it. Uh, so any other questions, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh? No, that's, that, that's all, thank you. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, so the report recommendations are that the Transit Commission recommend council approve the transit service evaluation criteria and priorities as described in this report. Uh, Councilor McKenney's asked for yeas and nays. So um, if the clerk could uh, call the uh, vote, please. Commissioner Brockington. Yes. Commissioner Terracotto. Yes. Commissioner Gower. Yes. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Nay. Commissioner McKenney. No. Commissioner Olson. Yes. Commissioner Suds. 
Yes. Commissioner Tierney? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Commissioner Wright Gilbert? No. Vice Chair Cloutier? We. Oui. Chair Hubley? Yes. Eight yeas, three nays. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate your, your help with that. Uh, so this item will be considered by council at, at the April 28th uh, meeting. Okay, so we're now moving on to uh, in-camera items. There's no in-camera. Notice a motion. Anybody have any motions? Okay, no notices, uh, inquiries. Seeing none, other business? Seeing none, uh, on adjournment, is the motion carried? Carried. Thank you. Carried to adjourn. Okay, our next regular meeting will be on Wednesday, May 19th. And um, Eric, could you tell us when the media availability will be? Perhaps uh, Mr. Manconi could vice chair, oh. uh, maybe in 15 minutes after the meeting. Chair, I would recommend you start it at one o'clock, if that works. 1 p.m., okay, there we go. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you.